Here we are live on the World Crypto Network. It's all happening as Bitcoin is now at $568. Following news that $18 million worth of Silk Road Bitcoin are going to be sold by the U.S. government. The U.S. government is selling off roughly 30,000 Bitcoins. That's nine different separate auctions of 3,000 Bitcoins each. The current price of Bitcoin is $568 following this news. We're joined by Chris Ellis, Theo Hello. Friedman, Derek J. Freeman, and Thomas Hunt as we watch hey, the price of Bitcoin live. Well, Chris, you called us here today. What will we do? Bitcoin is down. Well, for now, markets are a future pricing mechanism. So people are pricing in what they expect it to be in the future. So I wouldn't be so sure. The last time we saw um, a sharp drop like this relating to Silk Road, we saw a massive rally back up again. That's why I thought this it would be good. Uh, maybe we could take some calls and some comments on Twitter as well from guests because I think I've been looking at the troll box. I've also been reading through all the Twitter comments. And I think there's a general kind of bullish sentiment at the moment, and I'll tell you why. It's because all the startups now are being told that if you don't have a Bitcoin strategy, you haven't got a plan. Like you're not you're not going to succeed as a startup. So I've got. A, I think the narrative that we're telling at the moment has something to do with Bitcoin is going to be mainstream. This is a fait accompli. The story's already written. It's going to happen anyway. I think what the market's doing at the moment is it's deliberately lowering the price because you're not you're not going to want to support a, a price if you know that lots of coins are about to be incoming. I think people are willing to buy. That's what this currently tells me. They just don't want to buy at the current price. So I think we could see a repeat of what we saw. Do you remember when we went like down to like $90? Let me see if I can pull up that price chart. One second, um, because it actually went up within the day. It went up like within a yeah. few hours. It's that one. Do you remember that one? And this yeah. was back in, on the second of October, um, or in Bitcoin land. That's like an eon ago. And it went down. It was like it was just after. It was after the April thing. Uh, we had that long, um, what what I call the shark attack, where we had. The, the guy that was just manipulating the market, just selling like every Sunday, um, he would just sell into the market. Then we had a slow rise up, we had a, a, a massive sell off when the Silk Road news hit. And then we had that whole China um, uh, bull run all the way up to 1200. It turns out that may have well have been a lot of manipulation. And I think you're seeing the same thing again here. I think you're going to see the, sa the same kind of story. So I think there's still a lot more news to come. I think the market is going to be looking for, is going to be studying those headlines. Um, so it'll be really, really interesting. Have any of you guys heard anything? No. Oh. I, I do think this was a bit of uncertainty that was out there, and we are removing from that uncertainty from the market. Uh, everyone knew yeah. that the government was going to sell the Dread Pirate Roberts bitcoins. Now the government's announced that they are selling them. It seems like they're selling them in a responsible manner. Uh, 3,000 packs of Bitcoins aren't going to be bought by a pump and dumper, someone that's just going to get rid of them. We're probably looking at large institutions like the second market yeah. ETF and the Winklevoss ETF buying these Bitcoins. And, and once they do, they're probably going to hold them and sell them off as part of their ETF at far higher prices. Yeah. Have you heard about the um, requirements uh, to enter the auction? You have to um, deposit two hundred thousand dollars, and of course you have to have you know photo ID, and I don't know if you have to like give your fingerprints or whatever. But I mean, yeah, that's you know, like you said, that puts a pretty big barrier on um, who's going to enter the auction. It's just not going to be any old person that's going to enter the auction. It's um, just yeah. like the Dread Pirate Roberts would have wanted it. Everyone needs a photo ID and a government-approved two hundred thousand dollar loan. So. And remember, right. these are stolen coins. Like the, the feds did actually steal these coins off of, off of somebody. So the, these yeah. are stolen coins that are entering the market. They've also got a slight art market value to them as well, because they're they're going to be somewhat collectible, yes. I imagine. I think some well, people are just going to want to hang them. Yeah. And also, you know, we, we've also heard rumors recently that Bitstamp is now um, questioning anyone withdrawing large withdrawals from their exchange. I, yeah. I've seen a few sort of credible um, statements about it. I haven't heard anything officially, so people well, should do their own research. Well, what, if you, what do you know about it, Theo? 
Well, um, I know I already on another um, one of the call-in shows. I already commented when a bit when Bitstamp got audited. Um, I was talking about how already in um, I think November December uh, last year before the uh, China crash, uh, some people in my area um, yeah they they sold uh, some bitcoins on Bitstamp and. Uh, yeah, they got an email. Hey, uh, where'd you get those bitcoins from? How long have you had them? Where are you selling now? It's not like I mean, they went through the whole process of getting um, verified by Bitstamp and had sold bitcoins before. It's not like a new account. I don't mm -hmm. know exactly the amount they were selling. If that was somehow suspicious, but um, okay, the price had gone up a lot, you know, because it was the November December bubble, but. Um, still already then and then there were have been um, several stories on reddit months ago um, about similar things that bitstamp is require was requiring people to yeah you know I asked them asking them all kinds of really weird questions similar to what I said you know where would you get them we need a lot more information from you I mean yeah maybe some of them uh, were suspicious uh, selling a large amount suddenly or something like that but um, I mean that already uh, set alarms alarm bells off in my mind because we've seen that before you know everyone remembers um, Mt. Gox in let's say I don't know what uh, July August uh, last year people trying to you know get their fiat uh, withdrawals it wouldn't work and sometimes they would, um, you know, claim that you had stolen coins, and uh, you know, just block your account. And they probably just took those funds. So I mean, and um, there was a really weird um, note on Pastebin posted today. Have you seen it? No, BTC, it's not like so Bryce uh, this is, posted up this uh, thing. BTC Drac. Have you heard of him? Nope. Okay. Well. Uh, I won't go along and read the whole thing, but he basically sums up some of the things that I said, but he just goes into a lot more detail, and he goes in and, you know, lists reasons to be alarmed, and he's basically saying what you can see on um, some of the charts, if you look at it, that uh, he claims that the so-called whales have moved over to Bitfinex, and you can just check it out with the volume. So he says that basically, to sum it up, um, the whales, you know, have information that not everyone has, probably, or they're talking amongst themselves and they've already exited Bitstamp. So the whales have managed to exit. And um, if we're seeing a price run on um, Bitstamp or if people are having problems withdrawing their Bitcoins or their fiat, then I think that we could have, um, I don't know if we're going to have Mt. Gox number two, I don't want to say that, but I mean, it doesn't look positive at this moment, you know. I mean, well, it, we don't know anything officially, so we don't want to cause a panic or a run. Yeah, on I don't want to. I don't want to cause a panic. Uh, I'm just saying no people should be cautious. Trading money in an exchange—that's trading money. If you're saving your money, you should save it in a paper wallet or in a more secure offline manner. If you're yeah. if you're saving your money in the exchange, you should probably move it out anyway. So yeah, people people don't do that, and yeah. let's talk about why they don't do that because they don't want to be the last out the door when something like this happens today. They want yeah. the money there so they can log in and sell it because they don't want it stuck in the blockchain for 40 minutes, and that's what we saw happen with Gox. And I know many good people, very smart people, um, who had their money on there. I had some money on there that was holding for a friend and more for me. Um, so it's it it's a problem. Um, that we've got because our attitudes, I think, at the moment are a little bit backwards in this community. We talk about the ideals, and a lot of airtime is given to the visionaries, but then when the rubber hits the road, we're all storing them on these exchanges. And we're not, we're, what we're trying to do is increase our purchasing power. And whether it be the dollar or whether it be, you know, Litecoin, actually, we should talk a little bit about um, why we haven't seen a rise in Litecoin. Or dark coin because presumably the other altcoins should be going up because people are looking for somewhere to store their value. Probably, you know, preferably not in fiat. They want to do it maybe on a, uh, MCX, uh, uh, yeah, MCX or Cripsy or one of these others, um, so they can actually go into another altcoin. So you might see over the next 24 hours people start to look for other safe havens. We've seen that happen before when a Bitcoin specific news comes out that is uh, bearish for Bitcoin people look for other altcoins first before they switch to fiat. Yeah, that's true. 
Also, um, I just found an article um, about how uh, yesterday uh, Bitfinex uh, distanced themselves from Bitstamp. So it used to be that the exchange Bitf Bitfinex uh, actually sourced some of their bitcoins from Bitstamp, like 20% or something, and they and it wasn't a secret. They made that public, and then so now they've officially uh, broken ties with them for whatever reason, you know. So it kind of puts into question um, what's going on at Bitstamp. You got that going on. You got this whole auction thing going on. And uh, in the troll box, uh, what's happening is some people are saying, "Yeah, the uh, government is selling, uh, is, is selling the coins at market and all this stuff." And I think some people are just um, silly and not, you know, checking the sources and are thinking that the government is uh, selling the coins on BTCE or something right now, you know, because people are saying that in the chat, you know, and they're not really, you know, checking on what's going really going on. Well, th those are the those are the manipulators that I was um, having scorn over on my Twitter earlier on when I said like this is what I really regret about the Bitcoin community is a lot of people do sit inside of these um, chat rooms and they just use them to play other people because people get very vulnerable when they're in there and they're approaching a decision point they're not sure what to do and so they just say oh I'll just listen to someone else and that's the biggest mistake you can actually make is listening to somebody else in this in this environment. Well, yeah, since, we're, take a look at the troll since box, we're talking please. about the troll box, let's go ahead and get in there. So at the very top, just let's go ahead and see what's going on. Jansen, troll buster, don't buy, wait, <laughs> has. The referee decision in the game is so shit. Even Bitcoin drops, holy moly. Screenfield, a simple check on page properties would tell you as much. 18 million back in circulation. I hope they do. I transferred all my fiat to Chinese exchanges, and for $40 extra, I want to transfer it back. If someone wants to dump half a million, they will. It's FUD. Who gives a damn if they're stolen? And then finally at the bottom, this guy seems to be pretty reasonable. Laughing out loud. People are freaking out about 18 million government sale is ridiculous. With a $7 billion market cap, at the moment, 18 million would only change the price by a small percentage, maybe a few dollars. It's time to take advantage of the market and enjoy some cheap coins. So there you go, Chris. A line in your troll box. What do you think? What do you? Each one of the statements. Uh, you know, who's so who's the trick? There's, there's a real art to reading the troll box, okay? Because there are some real gems in there, and they they're, and they're, they're on like a, a a bed of manure, okay? So most of it is just absolute junk. Most of it is just there to play you. Uh, they're not your friends. They're not independent financial advisors. They are there to get you. You are you are the bait. And um, every now and again, you'll get someone who will just say something really, really smart. And I almost think of the troll box as like a test. And it, it, what it tests for is good, honest people that are always seeking out the truth and know the truth when they when they see it. They can now recognize it. And, um, yeah, I mean, it, he sounds like he's being perfectly rational. But, you know, it's usually times like this when it's time to buy. When you see a big red candle and people are behaving really, really irrationally, that's usually when you start scaling in. And the, the way to make that work is to buy in slowly and not get greedy and just buy in. Just Let's say you've already got a budget of $500 that, that you want to uh, buy in with. What you do is you buy in with, say, $100 every hour, every four hours, as it continues to go down. Because every time it goes down more than it did, the chances of it continuing decrease over time. Like the, the chances of it going down by like 90% are very, very small. So if you keep seeing it go down, you just keep on buying. There is also something, and I'm not recommending this by the way, but it just as a point of interest, you can look up something called the Martingale strategy, which is a flawed gambling strategy, which is every time you lose, you redouble your bet each time. And the idea is that if you've got an infinite amount of funds, eventually you will get your money back and plus, you, plus you'll win some. There are people um, on these exchanges who I know advocate this method. You should be really, really cautious about that. If you do buy your Bitcoins, I do recommend that you take them straight off the exchange. You save some, you spend some, you donate some, and maybe you, you trade some to help manage your risk. But it's times like these when you get that sinking feeling and it's really, really scary and everyone else is selling, that's usually the right time to buy. We've got more troll box action with Coin Action, who says that 550 was predictable after the rise we had last week. It's a healthy correction, but I hope not the end of the drop. Otherwise, a new downtrend and a bear again. 
We've also got some good jokes going on up here. My dad bit coin once. He said he never will again. And also, my coin is a bit dad. You're a dad. No, you're a dad. We're joined by Derek J. Freeman. Derek, what do you think's going on today with the Silk Road sale on Bitcoin markets? Well, Still muted. obviously, it's disappointing to see the price drop. Any the price drop, uh, well, kept it. Uh, Ross Ulbricht or or Dread Pirate Roberts, as it were. His value has increased since the time the Bitcoins were stolen. They were, uh, I guess, in between $100 and $200 each at that time. So $550 does not look so bad. The government's going to fit of uh, like four or five times. So that's just something to consider while people are talking about, oh my gosh, the price is going down. Well, if you look on it, they've actually gone up since instead. So, that's interesting. Also, all, all the money that we're losing today is really the government's money. Now, the government's going to go off at a lower price. Their sale is now worth well, less than it was. Go ahead, Derek. So. Yeah. So, if there's anyone on the panel who can enlighten me, I'm curious if it's there wouldn't be much... Um, it, it wouldn't be so likely, but is it possible that people on the network could deny the transactions, or in other words, not confirm the transactions of the sales from the government? I think it would be possible, but basically all of the mining pools that are mining would all have to agree, because you don't know who's going to um, who's going to uh, solve that block, because um, the mining pools or the miners, doesn't matter if it's a solo miner or a mining pool, um, it's not, um, you don't have to write the transactions into the block if you don't want to. So, for example, there were even some really weird ones that happened this year that had like one or two transactions in the whole block. So theoretically it would be possible if all of, so if Ghash said they wouldn't do it, then you'd already have almost 50%. And then uh, if a few other pools said they wouldn't do it, then that would... I don't know if that's a good uh, strategy necessarily. You would, have because, to, yeah. you would have to buy your own mining equipment. You could get it processed, but yeah. you'd have to process it. You'd have to take your chances with your own mining equipment and process it yourself. You'd have to keep double spending your coins until eventually it got through. Yeah. So it seems possible, but unlikely that that would occur. Yeah, it's highly unlikely. There's been yeah. talk about coloring the coins or marking the coins, but then we have to check the coins every time we transact with coins, and that's a difficult process. No, 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 don't, don't even go there. We've been like Andreas summed it up really well. The common law has has been all over this for the last two hundred years. It's in Scots law, like I think it originates from there. That you can't start tainting currency because it just ends up destroying and undermining the trust in the entire currency system. Um, look, look how much drugs are tainted on all of our banknotes anyway. Um, it's just it's just not practical and people will just leave and then another currency, look how many altcoins there are that would be willing to, to take up that market share if Bitcoin did something like that. We're also joined by coin artist Marguerite from Twitter. What's going on Marguerite? What do you think about the uh, Bitcoin price drop today? Yeah, I uh, wasn't really expecting that. I was, uh, you know, distracted making graphics about Chris's trip that now his Bitcoins are worth a lot less, so that's depressing. Um, it's been but... a little depressing, but Chris's st trip is still going on, and we're still uh, raising funds for Chris to go all the way from London to Washington, D.C., the impossible journey of one man, one airplane and donated bitcoins. So we start out with this great graphic by Philippe. You can see the beard on the Chris Ellis. I wish you could zoom in more so you could really get that effect. And we had a couple other graphics. Bitcoin Rat sent in Chris Ellis in AC DC Bitcoin in the Beltway. And you can see that sharp hat that Chris is wearing. Very cool. And then now Coin Artist has suggested that Chris Ellis should wear an America tank top while he's in America. As you can see, this man has written on his guns. They're labeled Freedom and Deep Fried Twinkies. 
Yeah, I actually don't have any guns, so it's kind of going to look a bit ridiculous. But I yeah, you need, I think you need that uh, America uh, shirt for the airport, so that you. Can oh yeah, you're right. Easily. Actually, I need there to be go. going in with like yeah. Benjamin Franklin quotes. I need to. Yeah. I need to Amazon brush up on the order. Constitution. Oh <laughs> no, man, that's not too to much. Go no, through. no, no, not that's too much. You don't want to look like a patriot too much. That you don't want to ne- think. You don't. No, want because they don't even know about the Constitution, right? Exactly. 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 New exactly. enemies are the patriots. The the new terrorists are domestic terrorists. Is what we've been told. That's what we're reading on the card. And also, Chris will be modeling these awesome trousers, the David Bowie style, from Coin Artist herself. Yeah, that, that's not happening. That, that's not happening. <laughs> we'll just keep that on the screen a little longer so that everyone can focus on David Bowie's incredible outfit. Look at that. New space alien. That's Chris's face, though. He just looks... <laughs> You know, it's the British. That, that's look. not my face. It is your face. Is it? I didn't even it recognize. Is. It. I'm trying to zoom in. I don't Where's know if I have the right software. Let's see. <laughs> enhance, enhance. Oh, no. Where, where a, is it from? Uh, just it's a screenshot. Oh, okay. Uh, how funny. That but, uh, was actually David Bowie. <laughs> used to be. <laughs> but um, so okay, back to the to the, what's happening in the story. Um, I didn't. I I have a moral uh, dilemma with the situation that's happening. I don't think they should be auctioning these coins at all until this case is resolved. Because Ross Albrecht is saying that he they belong to him. So I feel like I mean we haven't said he's guilty. So why are we giving someone's property away? Exactly. Yeah, Pierre Bell actually made a comment, we should not blacklist these coins, we should tell the government to fuck off like any other group of thieves. And you're right, he hasn't actually been convicted of anything yet, so why are they even selling them? Now these are actually not uh, Ross Albrecht's coins, these are the coins that they got off of the Silk Road servers. So I'm guessing the reason they're selling these is because they're assuming that, well, they were used for illegal activities, so they can automatically assume that that's okay, regardless of whether or not um, yeah. Brecht is, is prosecuted, I, think I guess. This, I think this is daily business. I mean, there's tons of stuff auctioned. And uh, if all the cases have been closed or whatever, they confiscate all kinds of stuff every day. And they there's all kinds of government auctions, you know, selling confiscated stuff. I mean, they just confiscate stuff, confiscate things uh, as they want and auction them all. And remember, right. they, they are converting this money into cash. So there is a chance if, if suddenly, let's say, for example, the Silk Road was actually manufacturing cookies and this whole case was wrong, right? I think they would have to give him the cash back, but they wouldn't be able to get the bitcoins back or the drug manufacturing equipment or the boats you use to move drugs on or the cars. They're going to like immediately convert those into cash because I think those other things lose value is the general idea, and the government needs to get the most cash out of it, and then they would give it back to you, I think is the general idea. So. Okay, um, right, because he owns. He says that he owns twenty nine thousand of them, and then also there's been other companies coming that came forward and said that some of those coins were theirs, and they weren't involved in the illegal activity, so they didn't think that they should have been claimed. So I hope that's the case. I hope they do get their money back at the end. That's going to be a tough one to prove, but <laughs> good luck to them. I hope it works out. But uh, we're at. Let's do a price check. We're at. 575 on the uh, one hour chart we've had kind of a range finder and then we've had a red range finder so still remember on. we need we need 24 hours for this information to be priced in china is uh, coming online now so the chinese markets will also have to learn about this news it will have to be translated into a new language uh, for, for a large part they're going to have to digest it try to work out how it's going to fit into their plans then we're going to need to repeat the same process for all the other time zones until we can come to an accurate conclusion about what is actually happening but i still think we've got some way some way to go I also have a problem with the $200,000 uh, mandatory wire to the government. I feel like that's l- eliminating a lot of parties from participating. I, yeah, but I, think, I think that's the point, though. I think they want people that have got a lot of money because they want to get the best possible price. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know exactly, but I think that might be standard for some auctions of this size. You know, They just have to have a deposit. I don't know if it's extraordinary 
for a government auction or not. We'd have to go check out one of the government auction sites and see if they're auctioning like a mansion or a big house or something and see how much you have to deposit just to participate. You know, because you've got to pay. I think if I read it right, you've got to pay the same day when you win the auction. <laughs> yeah, that would make sense. You know? yeah, I'm sure the government yeah. wants their money. So that's so that, where, um, where does the money go been. now? Does that go back to like uh, where where taxpayers' money goes? It goes on public services, things like that. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, theoretically, it's tough to say. I'm not. I don't. I don't think it goes immediately into the general fund. I think it would go. Um, I think the court case still has to be decided. I think it goes into a holding fund until the court case is decided. Then, it would probably go. It's a federal case. It would probably go back to the federal government, and they would probably general fund it, and then probably spend it on something, well, some kind of taxpayer business. Everyone's a libertarian now. I don't want to like take any uh, stands on government programs, but uh. they don't have to have these huge like it broken up into such big portions. They could have had smaller. I mean, they could have done it to be more fair than what they're doing. I, I like the big portions. To me, it says that an institutional investor like Second Market or the Winklevoss ETF is going to get these bitcoins. Someone that has an interest in, um, you probably to win the auction, you're going to have to pay more than everyone else, right? So the person who's going to pay more than anyone else is going to value them more, who's less likely to sell them quickly. Uh, the more auction. Uh, items there would be, the more complex, the more buyers it would invite, I don't know that that would get them a bigger price. It might just cause more uncertainty with more random hey, collections of big why don't we, uh, we don't really have a lot of time, but we need to just get a fund together with a whole bunch of people and then just, you know, buy one of those blocks. You know, everyone, you know, and you split it up proportionally. It's like a buying pool, you know. Even everyone just putting their... up the 200000 so we could get into the auction so we could see what it was like would be <laughs> yeah. probably worth it even if we couldn't bid. Um, I recall a story a few years ago where a guy got into a land auction and he was able to bid against the oil companies and he bought several parcels of land uh, despite the fact that he didn't have any money and uh, he was able to screw up the entire works for like months and months they weren't able to build their pipeline or whatever they wanted to build they had to wait so um, it seems unlikely but yeah it would be great to be a fly on the wall during that auction I'd love to see who was there or how they actually do it, uh, probably online or something. I don't, I don't think they'd gather them in a room and have paddles. But uh, you can always hope. We don't, we don't really know until it happens. Uh, hopefully, someone will tell us though. But. There's quite a large um, cell wall. You see that now down here with this, this red bar here. This is actually the the number of uh, cells at a given price. So you can see that there's quite a large cell order there of like, well, not that much, maybe 963. Bitcoins, which is probably going to be stopping the price from moving upwards. I don't know that you can see that on Bitcoin Wisdom as well, Tom, because it does it does kind of show it on there, but not not as not as clear as on Bitcoinity. No, I'm on Bitcoinity, so I think I think that probably somebody imagines that the price is going to go down because no new information is entered the market at this stage it's all just speculation so this is usually the point where the manipulators start to come in and they start to start telling stories on the charts and they get all kinds of sock puppet accounts that go into all the chat rooms and they start telling you a story about how the price is going to continue to go down and so that they can keep continue to buy as you're selling and they put these large sell walls on the exchanges, which look very threatening and very intimidating, it's happened on the Litecoin exchange quite a number of times, where someone will put two million dollars worth of Litecoin at a price just above where we are, as a way of like making you hold back and maybe you don't want to, you know, you don't want to buy in just yet because you don't anticipate other people doing the same. Do they actually have to have the funds to put these walls up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. they absolutely do. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a, it's a massive game of chicken, but I think a lot of them are run by automated computers, so I think the computer automatically takes away. And if you think about it rationally, you're not going to want to put anything like this kind of money on an exchange unless you know the owners, because you wouldn't put money on an exchange, that, that like $2 million worth of coins on an exchange unless you knew who was running the thing, right? 
Um, so it's usually what's called a preferential order type where you know the directors of the exchange, you've been called in because they need some liquidity, other people won't trade on your platform unless they see lots of trading going on because they always want to know that they can get a good price for it. So they usually pay someone who's very rich to come in or not pay them, I mean they just invite them in and let them do what they want so, so it's actually a business for them. And then they're able to generate these preferential orders and what that means is that when they put an order in, their order gets seen before everyone else's, even if they place the order later. So two people put an order in at like $10, and they put it in after you, but their order still gets, gets seen first because they're friends with the people that run the exchange. So they'll often have complicated software like bots that will run, where as soon as people start eating into the wall, the bot will just withdraw the order instantly, and it just won't be there. And there have been people on BTCE that have reported that, that orders should have gone through and they didn't because they put it in in time and then it just kind of disappeared. Looking at the chart still, it looks like on the uh, three-day, the orange line's almost flat here, like the average. Well, yeah, because we haven't really been moving very much recently. That's why. And we almost perfectly went up and perfectly came back down to the orange line. Well, that, that's that's um, a, a moving average. So you've you've got two lines there. One that's like a f probably a five-day moving average, which will be the one that's closely following the candlesticks. That one that you're on there, the blue one. And then the yeah. the, the orange line will be like a, maybe a twenty-day. I don't know what you've got it set to, or thirty-day moving average. Uh -huh. Yeah, I want the blue line to go above the orange line. Well, it, you, you, nobody can predict the future. No one can predict the market. If we, if we zoom back over here, we can see that the blue line was significantly above the orange line. Then we were happy, right? Then not so happy. And then now, like, they're still trying to meet. They never seem to meet. I just change the chart every time they never meet. So the, the, old, the old trick was that you bought when they crossed over to the upside and you sold when they crossed to the downside. I don't really recommend you do it. I mean, people do do it. It's called following the trend. The trend is your friend. But then all that happens is everyone does it. Everyone's looking at the same information. By the time you've seen the price, so has everybody else. You're all watching the same YouTube videos. You're all watch, reading the same books. And so you will buy at the same time. And of course, the, then the technique doesn't work anymore. Um, yeah, you have to use more than one indicator, though, as a minimum. Right. I mean, if you just used one and you just follow the trend, you're not going to gain an advantage. But I don't know if everyone really gets that. I mean, it, I mean, we've talked about it several times. People have to realize that uh, if you want to trade, trading is reaction, not predicting the future. You react. You look at the situation and you do something or you do nothing. You don't try to predict the future. Nobody can predict the future. I mean, you can maybe predict a trend a little bit, but every, I mean, if you, I mean, you can try to predict the future, but you'll probably be wrong. Hillary Clinton, president, 2016. Oh, no. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a great sticker today. It's, um, they apparently just got sued off of Cafe Press, and then they got re-added. It's a parody of the It's Hillary sticker which I guess her campaign is putting out, it says, it's oligarchy. Great <laughs> sticker. Still five bucks, though. Not happening. So, yeah, Bitcoin prices are down. And we need to send Chris to D.C. What are we going to do? Well, I already sold some. It's fine. I sold some because I saw it around 600, and I could sort of see it was rolling over, and I thought, yeah, I better make sure that I've got you, know. you saw the moving averages cross, and then you took action. No, I just, I just didn't see any point in taking a risk on money that wasn't mine anyway. It was a bonus. It was very kindly and slightly insanely given to me by a group of people that have never met me before. Um, so that was kind of cool. But I thought I'd just do the responsible thing, and I just said uh, I had some bitcoins left over on Bitstamp from that I should have taken off. There, you see, I'm actually saying one thing and doing another, and so I thought I would sell them. <laughs> And then, then, then the news came out, and I was like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, I'm glad I sold them. Um, but I won't buy it back in. I'll probably just use it to pay for, the, pay for the flight and stuff. We do have 27 donors so far. We've raised 2.59 Bitcoin. I'm learning that we need to stick to that Bitcoin number because it's the one that doesn't change. Because so, earlier today, we'd only raised about two Bitcoins. 
So 2.59 Bitcoin is much more than two. So thank you to everyone who's donated. We got another 0.5 which is a really cool donation. We also got some $5 donations, which, again, is the lifeblood of this thing. If we had 1,000 people donating $5, this would be over. If we had 100,000 people donating $5, you guys could all come party on my yacht. But um, well, We, need, we need some ideas from people. Now that people have very kindly sent me all this money, like they need to be telling me what ideas of like videos and stuff because we're going to be going around with cameras and microphones and... Things. So people need to tell us like who they want us to talk to, what they want us to talk about, what their favorite topics are. You could visit uh, the FBI headquarters. <laughs> and is that where is that? It's um it's near um the Museum for Natural History. I think it's around the corner. Yeah, it's in DC. It's right downtown. It's very oh yeah, nice. to get get rid of that one, Tom. Like that was like that was terrible. All right, I get rid of. It. I still think it's fine. And not as bad as it could be. It could be a lot worse. But yeah, let's see what's going on. We've got some questions and answers. Ah, uh, great. If you have any questions, go ahead and switch over to the Google Hangout. There's an overlay on your screen. If you click that, it'll let you ask us questions and we'll give you answers. So this is a good time to go ahead and send those in. We don't have any questions so far. Chris, do you have any questions on your Twitter? I do not. I had people, like, I read out that comment earlier, but people just seem to be sitting back and watching at the moment. Let's see. My Twitter got too large for me to read. What has is, what is Darkcoin been doing? Uh, going down. I'm watching that much. Uh, it looks like Paige is picking a fight with the uh, online Bitcoin conference. So that's, that's something that's happening. Uh, Darkcoin price. Let's go to Cripsy. Let's see what's Dark coin is at a uh, 0175. Um, hold on. So does that mean that Litecoin is the only one that's actually picked up a little bit? Litecoin does have a bit of an uptrend. Uh, it's at ten dollars and nine cents a coin. Um, not that. I don't know. I haven't looked at the others. I don't I haven't looked at Namecoin or Peercoin. I think Namecoin gained a little bit from the bottom too. Hold on. Yeah, it's starting to go up too a little bit. And also, as per my prediction uh, last time, I think on the Bitcoin group, the hash rate has gone shot back up in the days leading up to the difficulty adjustment. Because we, I've seen it before um, in the last couple of difficulty adjustments that as soon as the difficulty changes, um, the miners seem to turn off their mining rigs, get the difficulty prediction down below 15% and then about six days before the difficulty is about to change again they ramp it up so that 13 to 14 peta hashes that suddenly went missing towards the end of the last difficulty change has suddenly crept back onto the network and that's the, that's just too much as a percentage that's more than 10% of the overall network hash rate that's not a coincidence I don't think what do you think Theo? You think yeah, it sounds like I, yeah, I think miners are pretty smart. You know, I mean, they've got a lot invested, and uh, if you've got a small mining farm, or even if you're just a small miner at home, um, I'm sure you you know about that. I mean, I don't know if they're really colluding together, but uh, yeah, well, definitely. they've all got each other. They've all got each other's phone numbers. I mean, all those pools, yeah. they're all on IRC channels, and you you sure, look at how but... much like Gigahash, uh, Ghash.io. Mm -hmm. Is doing, and also you've got the, this market here, which I showed a couple of episodes ago, which is the on on Sexio, which is owned by the same company as as GigaHash. In fact, you're actually buying hash rate off the GigaHash mining pool. I think um, yeah. this is where traders actually get to buy and sell hash rate. Um, and I, I mean, it's a very tricky market. I just don't know how you're supposed to make any money in this market because well, the price just goes down. How? Um, well, uh, you buy GigaHash. And then you set a, a stop. You you have to have a bot, and you set a stop loss so that uh, if it crashes, then you've secured the value of your giga hashes. And it's just kind of like, but basically the whole thing with buying giga hashes is like a chicken. It's like playing chicken, like you were saying, because if you hold it, then you're mining, and you're going to get a little bit of return. But if it goes down too much, then you're going to lose out because it's going to go down um, exponentially more than you're going to earn. With your mining, so the the only you're gonna in order to make any money, you're gonna have to sell your giga hashes back. 
it's kind of like selling your mining equipment when you're done mine with your mining equipment and it's not efficient anymore. So if you just let's say you bought it, uh, I don't know, oh oh seven or I don't know, oh seven five or whatever, then you just set the stop loss and then uh, okay, you could still lose, but um, the chances that you're going to lose a whole lot are a lot lower. So you just reduce the risk. But yeah, you're right. Pretty much, if you look at the long term, the prices just go down. But that, I don't see, even at those prices, you're never going to make your money back, not even close. Yeah, you have to sell even back your cash. Yeah, but the thing is, I think, I think the only way you could do it is with short-term trading. The only way I can think that they're doing it is by scraping little bits of profit here and there. And I think what they're doing is they're timing the difficulty and they're playing the market at the same time in Sexio. I think that's how they're playing it. I think they're buying and selling intraday. They're not. They're not waiting weeks. They're not holding these giga hashes for very long. I think they're selling about seven days before the difficulty changes, and then they're waiting for it to dump, and they're buying in on the dump, and then they're waiting for it to go back up, and they're selling. So they're not holding these these giga hashes for very long because it, you'd have to wait. I worked out you'd ha it would take you about five years just to, just to break even, and by that time the giga hashes are worthless anyway because we're into exa you know exa hashes. By that stage, yeah. so the giga hash will be worth, you know, tiny fraction of what it's worth today. So I, I just yeah. don't see how this favors anyone other than the market maker. I don't see how this favors. It only, just it only favors. It, the mar it, it doesn't. It only favors the market maker. Right. But like I said, I mean, if you're able to buy your giga hash and you think of it as a kind of altcoin, basically, and then you sell it back for more than you bought it for, and in the meantime, when you're holding it. You get your your mining coins. So you're getting a kind. Of, it's kind of like if you're getting um, every few hours a little bit of dividend. So the longer you hold it, that's what I mean with the chicken match. I mean it's going. The price is going to go down. It's just a matter of time because the giga hashes are not going to be able to produce very much, uh, you know, returns. So it's just a matter of time before it crashes. So yeah, you're right. If you add it up, you're not going to. If you just were to hold the giga hashes for a few years, you would never make your money back. I mean, they're really expensive if you look at it like that. And I think one of the things that makes me really skeptical about Sexio and the, and the GigaHash uh, system is their referrals. Like the only people, like you see, like people put them in their footers on all of the, the, the forums and the blogs and stuff, and every time you click on that person's referral link, they get some free GigaHash, or they get, what, what yeah. do they get? Yeah, they get some free giga hashes, I think. Well, you get. Um, I can look. I have an account. I mean, uh, I think you. Um, I don't have any referrals though. If you if you want to sign up, three, let me know. You get like a three percent boost on whatever exactly. whatever you've got. And exactly. oh yeah, I could just I could just use your referral link. And yeah, yeah, right, yeah. No. Um, but yeah, this, this is like what little... this is what concerns me is you can set up a nice looking website, right? The reason why people use their website is because it's got nice graphics, got good in infographics. Um, they've done a really good marketing campaign. It looks really slick, but it's actually quite damaging to the Bitcoin ecosystem because they have all this hash rate, and it ends up centralizing the server, undermines people's confidence, and then you get all these people that just come in and gamble all day, and that and they end up getting addicted to their losses. You know, they just sit there all day like the people in the troll box that we're watching right now, and most of them are just being quick, played. Quick troll box update, starting get from out. the top. Wherefore art thou, Metroid? We need guidance. Kokalis, even with this news, Bitcoin is still in pretty good shape. Bogart, someone should make a bit bet on that. Kokalis, what news? Now, this is a great statement here. Chris, you're going to have to unpack this one after. Derek, I'm a bad person if some people is losing money and I'm happy. Vic Velcro, those noobs must be really stupid. I mean, really. Bitcoin Miner 2012. Silk Road Bitcoin will be sold at value of time of confiscation. I love how, and then Trading BTC really sums it up here. He says, I love how 17 million worth of coins to get sold, and then the price reacts just like that. It just goes to show you how small the Bitcoin market really is. If someone announced a $17 million sale of gold or stock shares, no one would even blink. And then finally, a wicked dude, get out now, sell, sell, sell. Is that just a so the, so the wicked, wicked dude trollbox. has a buy order he'd like you to fill. Wick, <laughs> the last guy has a buy order, and yep. he'd really like it if you sold into that buy order. That's why he says that. Mm -hmm. And I really like um, 
I really like some of some of this stuff that actually comes out of the troll box. I find it's a very interesting like social experiment. I mean, because we've got most a, people... a good quality joke with the Metroid up here at the top. We've got some information trading here. What news? He's not going to look it up. He's asking the troll box first. He could have typed yeah. that into Google, right? He yeah. made a choice, uh, troll box instead of Google, and then the troll box gave him, you know, Silk Road Bitcoin. Now this is an inter interesting note. At the value of the time of confiscation, does that just mean the auction is starting at $100 a coin? Because it's still an auction, right? So it's not like they're selling... Well, they, they, they've actually made 100% profit whatever happens because they didn't pay for any of these coins. These are well, stolen they've coins. they five times profit because 100 to 500, well, there's still... They haven't five times it. They never paid for them. They wow. haven't five times it. They're 100% up whatever they sell at. Unless you want to discount the price of the investigation... <laughs> take that off your profit. It just goes to show that the FBI is a business just like any other. They're performing a sequence of activities to, to achieve a certain outcome. When I went onto the homepage of the, that US Marshals site, there was a lot of marketing on that homepage telling you how skilled these guys were, how you shouldn't mess with these people, that they're really professional. It's just marketing. It's the same as any business. In you any have their, their marketing is live right here. For sale, twenty six thousand six hundred and sixty six hundred and fifty six point five one three zero six five two nine bitcoins. Lower, Thomas. It says that um, any fees, any of your wire transferring fees from your, your fiat, the buyer will have to pay for that. So they're taking Bitcoin and and still messing it up. <laughs> Oh, how are they gonna? They're gonna wire transfer the Bitcoin to me. I'd prefer if they just use the Bitcoin network, right? Oh, look, Chris has got a video with cowboys. Yeah. So this this is what I've got to look forward to when I come. Deputy U.S. Marshals are oh, skilled. Look how scary this is. This is terrifying. You do not want to mess with these people. Seriously, they're motivated. They're motivated, <laughs> Tom. Look how motivated he looks. He looks really motivated. And this is a really. Oh, I, and they're professional. I, 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 <laughs> That's so professional. They a are I have a she friend who's a U.S. Marshal, and she is pretty tough. They're well trained. I'm not gonna lie. They are extremely well trained. <laughs> Look how well trained he is. He's holding that door like a really well trained U.S. Marshal, and they're very. <laughs> experience. Just look at this guy climbing through like an amateur. He's not going to get anywhere. And they get the job done. That's the most important thing. They put human wow. beings in chains. That guy's I mean, guilty. Uh, yeah, he's guilty. He hasn't been charged yet, but he's definitely guilty. He should definitely sell all of his assets. <laughs> wow. Okay, so that was a pretty terrifying video. I got to give you that. I haven't run into a U.S. Marshal really ever, but um, if I did, I'll bet they would be professional and well-trained and ready to go. But that did, unfortunately for the Marshal Service, have all the trappings of an Al-Qaeda recruitment video. Uh, <laughs> uh, all that was missing was that scene where they do the jungle gym bars. That was a, and I, I'm sure that they could do the jungle gym bars. I'm not doubting that the U.S. Marshals can cross a jungle gym. But next time, think about that for the video too. You're missing it. I, I want to know what that guy was doing climbing through that kind of loft installation. I mean, what the hell was that about at the end? Like, what is he doing? Well, was a, he in the marshal? That was a raid. That was a raid. Like a right, lot of, so that a wasn't lot a criminal running, running away. Okay, I thought I thought the guy going up through the, the ceiling was like the criminal, and they were just standing there watching him and going, yeah, I'm really experienced. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think he, he is the criminal, but he might be stealing from a business that they've decreed as criminal. So he's yeah. probably going up and over a, a better security barrier uh, because they often have fake ceilings like that for the uh, electrical wires, the network cables. And uh, generally, yeah, you can climb right through if there's a better barrier down below. They just don't think anyone will take the time to climb through. Can, can we also dedicate some time to talking about the noob? Let's talk about the noob. The noob is N -O -O B. It's often used as like this third party that doesn't really exist because people that use the term noob are often noobs themselves. So like who are all the noobs buying on stamp at the fake pump, you know, and all this stuff. And and, and I just feel like it's this it's this kind of weird cultural phenomenon where where we try to generate a kind of outgroup bias where like if you're new around here, we're gonna make you feel really new by calling you a noob. 
I'm telling you, you don't understand how this works. You don't belong here. And if you don't wise up and learn how this game works like I had to and suffer all the losses that I had to suffer, then you don't you don't really belong here and you're gonna have to feel this like this insult. So you've always got this noob, like who are the noobs buying on this fake pump? As if to say the guy can tell that it's a fake pump and that you should know better. This this is why I hate these markets. Like earlier on, um, that guy is his name Tristan Winters on on uh, Twitter. Right. Yeah, Tristan Winters. He was sort of um, sort of pulling me up on the point that I made about how I regret the way the Bitcoin community or a large part of the Bitcoin community behaves when they're on these exchanges doing all this kind of stuff. And he was like, "Look, actually, we need more of these people." Um, because they provide much needed liquidity and it's like look I don't disagree that we need liquidity and genuine market makers who believe in the underlying technology um, my objection was that these people aren't real market makers all they're doing if you could look inside of the, the BTCE balance sheet you could see everyone's accounts which they can by the way and they often do to their advantage um, what you would just see is a whole load of people just moving their money around with a fat middleman just making chunks of money on the fees, right? That's what you would see. All they're doing is moving money from one troll to another. They're and not there actually a, generating. There was a great article this morning on Coinbase, of, uh, did I get right? Coindesk, about the um, accounting issues and that accounting fraud could be pretty much taken away because of Bitcoin. Uh, the ex exchanges don't have to be that way. They could be encrypted. It could be impossible for the exchange to know what's in your account, but they didn't write it that way yet. It also, we could see these money flows inside the exchange if they were using the blockchain, and it could be analyzed by outside, outside groups, and we could really see what kind of manipulation was going on inside these exchanges. And until that happens, they will be kind of black boxes like the Mark Carpellis, Mt. Gox exchange. Which again, everyone remember it. When you had your bitcoins in Mt. Gox, you held tokens or chips or tickets that said, "Hey, if you go to the counter, we'll give you a real bitcoin." And a lot of people tried to cash those in, and they couldn't get any real bitcoin even months before. So, so the, this just goes to prove that the best regulators are now on Reddit, and these are the people that should be policing things. And because these are the people that get the information first, they're the people that bring the most energy to that role, they're there to go through the blockchain, they often do, that's how we find out so quickly because someone has either got it on notification, they've got a particular Bitcoin address on notification, as soon as any coins move in or out of this address, it pings them, it sends them an email. And if that person wants to dedicate their time to investigating this particular person, they should be allowed to do that. And I think that that's all part of the, this new paradigm that we're moving into, that everyone becomes a police officer, everyone becomes responsible. Don't you Everybody think? is professional. Everybody is yeah. just curious. Everyone climbs up through <laughs> ceilings into lofts and performs raids and, you know, is motivated. We do have some questions. We've got a question, more of a comment from Tone P. He says, Chris, shh, you'll end up getting a cavity search. LOL. <laughs> We've also yeah, got. Uh, I've already, already got my Twitter on. I'm already looking forward to it. I was held up. You're, by oh, you're a public speaker speaking about technology. You're not a threat to anyone. You're not a problem. Like no one's going to need to look in your cavities. Uh, <laughs> I don't think so. Anyway, uh, we've got a question comment from Infinite Radio. He says, "Is this the future of breaking news? Much needed FUD police. I hope these spontaneous live videos become the norm." So thank you, Infinite Radio, Yay. for tuning in. We've got um, pretty much two questions that are exactly the same about Varicoin, which I thought was Vary, V-A-R-I, like you know a variety coin. But now I'm seeing at least this one is Vary with a Y. <laughs> so it's a very coin, very much coin, I guess. Very funny, guys. Um, so I don't know much about this coin, but they have a to-do list that's an Imgur image, and they have a guy that's sending it around. Um, Chris, do you know anything about Vericoin? Any ideas on this? Yeah, I've got an idea about it. I've got an idea that every single word in the English dictionary, if not more languages, will have the word coin put after them, and there will be a blockchain associated. I've, it's, it's the financialization of language. We are monetizing words now. Everything, everything's going to cost money in the future, including the words that we use. 
I would say back to the drawing board. I would focus more on the very being fun, not the very being whatever you're focusing on, which just seems like more like a confusion with Vari. I thought there already was a Vari coin. Did that already go up and down? I'm not sure. It went up. I don't know if it went down. See, so it didn't exist. So there's a very is what I'm saying. So money is an abstract concept. It doesn't actually exist. I think we had. Did we talk about this the other day? The fact that you know people put money into gold. They put it into land. They put it into stocks and housing and all kinds of different things. And it's really you're just trying to play a popularity game. Right. As soon as you've invested money in that particular vehicle, you want to tell everyone else to put their money in so that you get an appreciation and then you switch over to another category that you see is trending upwards and is getting more popular. And you want to get in early so you can cash out and then just keep moving around, just keep moving around. That's why I'm a little bit skeptical of these coins that are just dedicated for nothing but tipping because that ultimately isn't sustainable. It has to be used for other things as well because you can't just say, well, Dogecoin is just for tipping because at some point you're going to want to spend them. You're going to want to cash them out but then you've got to rely on somebody else coming along who's got them you know who, who's got some money they want to spend on tipping and I, I don't I don't really see that as being a sustainable strategy in the long term because all of, all of these things like the memes uh, I think it's great by the way I think it's fantastic that a community can emerge around a Japanese dog I think that's fantastic because it's a lot of fun it gets a lot of people into it that haven't got into cryptocurrency before I just don't see it being around in five years' time, do any of you? I, I just. I want. Just... I want to see. Uh, I want to see a decentralized exchange with Bitcoin. I feel like that we're just. It's like everyone is playing in the altcoin market because we're bored with Bitcoin in that way. If Bitcoin could get there to that next level, and um, I think people will get more interested. And also, we want to have the risk of all the centralized exchanges and the crap that happens with them. You know, you're not going to have so much fluctuation in the market then. If we had a reliable system to transfer the money between each other peer-to-peer, -peer, as it's supposed to be, then why would we need anything else? But we're still a little bit away from the decentralized exchange yet. There's still some time to go. Until and we get uh, there. Unfortunately, I think we're probably going to trade bitcoins for altcoins on that decentralized exchange. Getting fiat out there is going to be a real problem. It's probably, I think it's going to be a basket of fiat, like tokens or something, and when they're gone, the exchange will have no fiat. You'll have to go to a different exchange that has fiat, and maybe you'll have to trade for different types of fiat, different types, you know, Great Britain fiat, American fiat, the different types. So, and uh, we've got a, another one from Theo. He says there's an unpred coin, unpredictable coin. Great name, guys. But of course, right here in the uh, comments, they're saying, what about uh, something sexier like random coin, chaos coin, dynamo? Uh, I love it. Great. And then at the end they say, "Hey, what about shit? How about shit coin?" Or I think that already random exists. Random pre mine dump coin. <laughs> so. Well, on my uh, on my altcoin generator, I just went ahead and added you know every letter of the alphabet and every number. So there's A coin, B coin, C coin, D coin, E coin, um, etc. We've also got a question comment from Chris, and Chris says, "Yolo coin hashtag Chris." And uh, that brings up a good point that there should be coins after common first names, like a Chris coin, John coin, Tom coin, Kurt coin, Freddy coin, Fred coin. Like, obviously, Freddy coin, Fred coin would be competing against each other, the different variations. But yeah, think about names, guys. A lot of people have these names. They're going to be into John coin. John coin could have a whole secondary yes. market we haven't even thought John, about yet. It could be a John Richard Dick coin. John Richard Bitcoin. People could change their name to John Coin. They could be like, "I, my name is Johnson, and I'm changing it to John Coin, for the John Coin movement." You could get a hundred people to do it, like a marketing thing. I bet the media would put you in their the newspaper. So, more free ideas. But we've got lots more questions. Let's start with one from Donation Cryptocurrency, who writes. He says, "Amazing coincidence with the government accepting Bitcoin as a political donation." It is unfortunate for the politicians who are recently collecting Bitcoin donations, probably at $25 a piece, they're probably worth $23, $24 now. If they, But they probably cash them out pretty immediately. So they should be all right, and Bitcoin still works as a transfer mechanism. You can still donate to a political candidate right now. You just have to pay more Bitcoins to have the same amount of dollars. So, Any other thoughts on this one, guys? 
Well, it all depends on your time frame. Like all you're doing there is you're falling for the illusion of time because that money was never really yours in the first place. Like when someone says, "Oh, I lost a bunch of money because Bitcoin price went down." Well, you should never have been attached to it in 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 the beginning. You should never have assumed like it was always going to stay stay high. This is this is where we're going. This is the world is a volatile place. It always has been. And governments made it look and appear as though there was some stability by enforcing these these transient borders around you know arbitrary geographical lines, but that was never the reality. The world was always a volatile place, and so now it's just going to be more incumbent on us as individuals to take more personal responsibility. I, I think this is going to be the future. I think we're going to be li living in a much faster paced world where you are going to have these radical shifts and you're just going to have to be like Zen-like. You're just going to have to be ready for, for a move. We've got some comments about the earlier topic when you guys were talking about renting hash rate. Uh, donation Cryptocurrency says again that um, completely agree with you, Chris. You can only win by renting hash and hashing at the correct time and playing the hash rate game. And when you guys describe it like that, it really does sound more like gambling or more just straight up rolling dice. And maybe if you roll dice during the five to seven period, it's better than the seven to nine period. Uh, well, which... well, no, no, it's worse than gambling because at least when you go to a casino, it's provably random. Like you know that the the odds are stacked against you. The, the house has an edge, and they usually publish what their edge is. But with this game, you can't see how much it's rigged because the the people don't play unless they can cheat, right? The house will not even play unless it can cheat you. But the difference here is you don't know how much you're being screwed over, and that's what bothers me about all of this. Do you prefer proof of stake to proof of work, then? No, no, that's not what I'm, we're referring to. We're referring to the game that, that GigaHash.io are playing with the, the market, where they're selling their GigaHashes on Sexio, which is like a trading platform for GigaHashes. And what it does is it takes advantage of all the people that don't really understand how the market works. So what, what Donation Coin is saying is, as a miner, what you do is you sell your hash rate at the right time, and then you buy it back at the right time. It entirely favors the, the exchange and GigaHash, the pool, and the, some of the bigger miners on there, because they can just let their hash rate go when it's convenient. But as a as a major as a as a punter, you you've got to be super lucky to make any money back whatsoever, and actually you're going to lose. But what what I've noticed is people get addicted to dividends, right? You see it on crypto stocks, you see it on MCX now. People really really like getting dividends, even if it's a small amount. It still means something, even if it's only a few thousand satoshis that they get every six hours. That that little ding ding that you get on MCX now exchange. Does everyone know what I'm talking about? Yes. Every six hours, it, it just sort of does this sort of this dinging, and everyone goes ding ding in the chat box, and everyone's super excited. It's like, guys, you just got paid about a thousand satoshis. That's half a cent. Like, why are you getting all like this dopamine hit coming at you? Um, I think what's happening is these exchanges, like th these these market players, understand that psychology. They do the hard work of understanding human behavior that the regular folk don't do, and that's why they're making their money. And it's just, I just think it's a, a massive waste of human capital. Like, if, you, if you're going to have that empathetic capacity, right, as a business owner, and that's fundamentally what an entrepreneur is, somebody who has the ability to anticipate another person's demand and who is able to take a condition of volatility and make it somewhat more predictable, right? You take an, un, an area of uncertainty, you make it more predictable. Why would you have all that empathy with somebody and then twist the knife and say, right, now I understand what you need. I'm going to deliberately use that against you and set up a mechanism that's going to punish you ruthlessly and I'm going to keep putting, you know, it'll be like Facebook as a revolving door of clientele. Like, it's, you do not get any return on your investment by advertising on Facebook. If anything, it damages your brand because people just think you're cheap and you don't really know how to build authentic to community relations, right? And all that happens is new customers come in, they try it out, they realize it doesn't work, they stop using it. And because Facebook's so good on sales, they just keep generating more and more and more customers to come through the door. And so for a while, it looks like they're a successful business. And the share price, you know, goes up over time. But I think in the long term, everyone's just going to realize this whole thing is just a scam. We have a follow-up comment from Donation Coin. He says that Everyone he speaks to who are renting rigs are either cold storing Bitcoin or hashing altcoins and trading out for whatever Satoshis they can get. So it is a very um, volatile market. And remember that 
basically this means that you kind of have to doubt the sincerity of the miners. If the miners are only mining the altcoin to trade it into Bitcoin, they're only maintaining the network temporarily. Exactly. They're not this is what I've been telling everybody. We shouldn't be taking the hash rate for granted. This is what I've been telling everybody. I know, and also Peter at Feather, Bishnal, the lead developer at Feathercoin was saying this ages ago. That's why Feathercoin put in checkpointing and everyone had a go at us. And it's like, well, look, guys, you don't have to listen to the checkpoint broadcast if you don't want to. But we're putting it there because most people are honest people and we don't want to punish the honest miners. But if people are only in this for the dollars, if they don't even care about the network and they're only enforcing it for the profit motive, I think you'll find if you check the incentive structure in the, in the original bit Bitcoin white paper. I know I've said this before, so anyone who's followed me for a while, I apologize. But the one part of the paper where Satoshi was most unclear was page four on the incentive structure, where he said that miners should be or ought to be motivated to, to mine the honest chain rather than the dishonest one. It's the weakest part because it was the part that involved engineering the incentive structure for human behavior, which is notoriously unpredictable. So I don't think we should be taking 90 petahashes or 95 petahashes for granted. These people could just turn these rigs off at any time, and these are application-specific machines, so they can't be repurposed for anything else. They just end up becoming extremely expensive doorstops. It's a right good point, Chris, and it uh, reminds me of what uh, the former Fed chairman, Alan Greenspan, said when he came out of office, that he didn't believe that this kind of deceit and this kind of uh, distrust was possible, and that that's something that he learned. Unfortunately, he learned it at the effect of so many other people losing their homes and losing their you know, everything they had. So you have to be careful. The other thing I was going to say is that what you're saying about the um, the people that don't believe in anything and that um, they would uh, learn so much to manipulate people to only to destroy them. It reminds me of that old poem where he said, uh, "And the best lack all conviction, and the worst are full of a passionate intensity." So, pretty rough. Okay, guys, I gotta go. All right, later. Leo. Thanks for hanging with us. See yeah. you later. We've also got um, some more comments here. We've got some great quotes from a Donation Coin saying that, from the Hitchhiker's Guide, of course, money is simply an easy way to exchange goods and services. In the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the exiles to Earth used leaves as a form of money until hyperinflation took over, so they burned down all the trees. The classic story. As you as you recall, they wanted money to grow on trees, so they decreed that the yeah, it's, it's it's yeah, it's hilarious. I love that joke. Beautiful. Thing. Let's see. Um, looking some other questions. He says, uh, Chris Johnson says he'd be surprised if hash power mining was profitable. He thinks that GigaHash.io could work just as effectively, or more so, as a pyramid scheme with absolutely no hash rate. Interesting idea. Yeah, if, if you instead of investing in the miners, they should just hold the money for you in a pyramid scheme and have you get ten more people to join in, and that's the mining you're doing. Human mining. <laughs> That'd be rich. Let's see. I'm trying to find some more questions. Mix it up. Did you see very uh, the response to very clean up here? He came back with another about Mpeza. Mpeza. Yep, Mpeza is a real thing. Right. Well, I have a. He's. They're saying you know you can do so much with this coin. It has a future, but I have a problem with these coins making big claims. Like Chris, he said you you know Doge to the moon, and it was you know, a little bit bigger than life. I think a lot of the coins would say we're going to go to Africa and take over Africa and spread the wealth there. It's just. It's. I mean, how far back are you in your process in your business? Are you still at the level of a very beginning startup? Or are you a huge company that could actually do this? If you, you know, I think you should scale to the size that you're at, so people aren't being disheartened with your actual progress. Yeah, I think the only people that are getting into Africa are people that know members of governments and you know military leaders and stuff that are going to be able to bribe them. I don't see any well-meaning small-time entrepreneur getting any cryptocurrency into Africa. It's not going to happen. There's just too much corruption. I thought I thought it was a shoe in and I had ambitions for Feathercoin to do something similar. We were talking to people that uh, were 
uh, expats, who, African descendants who were expats in the UK, who said, yeah, you know, we can go back to, to our families in Uganda and places like this, we can take the feather coins back. But as I started to dig a little bit deeper and I started to look into it, I realized how well protected a lot of these industries are. Like, yeah, they can see how valuable this could potentially be and they're not going to let you go there. A friend of mine, Richard Bowes, who's a member of the UK Digital Currency Association here in London, he's a friend of mine. He uh, went to Kenya and he sort of came back and said, look, I mean, a lot of the infrastructure just isn't ready yet because to send one Bitcoin costs like the equivalent of a meal out there, you know, with the fees, you know, not just the mining fees that you have to pay for the network, but also the internet connection itself is very, very expensive. So where you have these bottlenecks and these choke points, that's where you're going to see... Um, the middlemen come in and the rent the rent seekers, the people that are going to want to stand at the gates and say, hmm, that looks like that's going to cost you. I can make that pain go away if you use my service and nobody else's and then they kind of create these monopolies. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm rather skeptical that, um, like I say, a well-meaning uh, social entrepreneur could actually make a difference in these markets. I think a lot of that, what you hear when you, I don't know about Vericoin because I haven't really looked into it. Um, when well, they, they say they stuff are, like this. They are claiming that Vericoin has a SMS wallet, and they are now saying that it is V-E-R-I coin, not V-E-R-Y. Yeah, but the coin. thing is, SMS so wallets, say what? Fe Feathercoin's got an SMS wallet. We set it up like, it, it, the, the developer coded it in a week. It's not that hard to do. And the thing is, it, the fact is it didn't work because you had to buy the text messages by the millions in order to make the business model work. And each each text message was two and a half euro cents. Um, so you had to buy them wholesale. You had to have friends in the right places. You had to have deals in place. It wasn't just, you know, you can't just buy this stuff off the shelf. You've got to know who, who to talk to and who to get drunk and you know, all this kind of thing. So all these people are saying, like, oh, we've got SMS wallets. All they're doing is they're just cashing in. Zetacoin did this. I actually had a friend of mine who works for an SMS company in Africa who actually does do stuff on the ground. And I went out for drinks with her and her friend. And she said, look, what is it with your community, like meaning cryptocurrency? Like, we've had no end of trouble. We've had to go to the press, do a statement saying that we've got nothing to do with this coin. And we never announced that we were going to do a partnership with them. It's like, why, why are they doing this to us? Why have we had to spend like two days cleaning up this mess? And I said, well, it's because they needed the price to go up. And they, they saw your company and they thought they could, you know, black it for a while and make an announcement like, yeah, we're working with, with this company. They don't need it to be true. They just need enough people to believe it. They get a few people to go onto the exchange. They start buying. They make the candles go up. You see the candles go up. You see the announcement. You think, oh, okay, yeah, this looks like this is going to be good. So you buy in. By the time someone has been smart enough to do their due diligence, to call the company, to do their background checks, get an answer from them, to get that out to the public, to make their own announcement, three days is plenty long enough for you to do a pump and dump on Cripsy. You can do a pump and dump on Cripsy in two or three hours. So I, I, I don't know about Vericoin, I might be completely wrong, and when I do my research I could end up being very humble, and if I do I'll come back on here and I'll apologize. Well, unfortunately, but looking at the I, chart, it does seem to follow the usual characteristics of an altcoin if you, as you've previously described. It starts out on the left, it goes up and has a peak, then it goes down, and then it trails off to the right. I mean, it's a little flatter than that. Um, and there's just today's chart, obviously today's not good for anybody, but um, you know, it's just another one of these, if you got in here, you're still looking to get out. So right, you're but stop, news okay, here. but stop yeah, looking okay. at the price then and start redefining what you mean by success. Because if you use the price as your mode of success, you are going to be very, very disappointed because nobody can control the price. You've got to say, right, rather than being led by the price, we're going to be led by adoption or we're going to be led by core community effort. We're going to be led by the amount of technical innovation, like with apparently with something like Darkcoin, for instance, right? You've got to think about how you push the whole industry forward and stop thinking about what you get out of this personally. When you get involved in one of these projects, you've got to completely dis detach yourself from any of the money and the time that you're going to put into it. And you've got to assume like you're not going to get anything out of it, and that's okay, right? And if you're not strong enough to do it, then you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. And I think the reason why 
um, you know, people are getting so unhappy about this stuff is because they're not being honest about their own expectations and they're lying to themselves and they're telling themselves that, yeah, I can take this, I can do this, I can put, you know, 10 grand into this coin and I'll be perfectly okay if it crashes. They watch it go up, they watch it crash all the way back down again and then they lament that they didn't sell at the high. And then that's what the next few days is for them. The next few days is them beating themselves up about why they didn't sell at the top. Well, don't look at the price and you won't be a slave to it anymore. You know, actually have some impact. Go out, get people involved. You know, go give some cryptocurrency to some homeless people or actually do something. And then when you've done it, photograph it, tweet it, tell people that you've done it and then get them to do the same thing. You know, hopefully we get to do that in Washington, D.C. We can actually go out, make some videos for people, take some pictures, show people what it's all about. Absolutely. We have been a config. There's been some discussion on Twitter about people who can't attend the Bitcoin in the Beltway conference, but who might want to meet up afterwards. So we might look into that kind of a situation depending on time and location, things like that. Uh, but yeah, we've got one more comment from Bruno. And I wanted to say that I think Bruno is the guy from Portugal that designed our logo. So thank you, Bruno, for designing our logo. And if we're wrong on Vericoin, it's very possible. It's tough to tell, and it's also yeah, tough I, to, I'm willing to be corrected. Read about it. So, so, but yeah, Bruno says that Chris is a very intelligent person and should research more about very coin, and that it's a very good coin. So, but you know, and everyone, we're open to that. It's possible. So, I've got, I've got a message on Wittgenstein said Chris Ellis is an eloquent speaker. I'm a crappy communicator live, so I just like to troll like a coward. So I respect him for that. That's on the troll box. Thank you very much, sir. Or in the troll box now? Oh, very cool. Yeah. What were you going to say, Marguerite? I was going to say, with a lot of the, the creative thinkers that we have in the altcoin market, I'm finding now that I want to use Bitcoin more in what I'm doing like as an artist. I want an auction to exist. I want different tools to exist for me to use as someone that um, wants to use it for my work. And I'm, you know, I'm kind of having some issues with that. I think some of this innovation should be geared to Bitcoin for these purposes, for user-friendly purposes. And um, and it's sad because I think there's a lot of people on this, but they can't make money right off. You know, with the startups of the altcoin, they make a lot of money right away for their startup companies. And so that's a big incentive. Um, if we could figure out a way to do that with Bitcoin, to get some money to your company right away with Bitcoin, then I think that's maybe how we should re redirect this. I mean. Does anyone else feel that way? I, I think it's like competition and anything else where if you have a really good idea, you can make money with Bitcoin. I mean, we saw the uh, the zero block iPhone app came out last year with a really cool interface. You can flip to the sides to see the chart. It was a uh, straightforward. It gave you the information. It was you know ran good. It was basic app, and they got bought by black ch or blockchain, and. Um, you know, something like that can happen if you have the right innovation, if you have a good tipping bot, if you have a good tipping app. It doesn't have to go to Dogecoin. It could go to Bitcoin. But we're seeing it go to other coins because presumably, you're right, the rewards are far bigger if they can get some, some of those early coins and sell them at the peak, as we've discussed, if they could be good gamblers. And they, they think that they are good gamblers because uh, they've chosen to take that risk and to go away from... Clearly, the, the herd, all of the venture capital, all of the smartest minds in the room are trading Bitcoin. They're working on things to use Bitcoin to sell it, to move it around. That seems to be where they are. So, yeah, if you wanted to not compete with them, you'd kind of move to an altcoin, I think. I don't know. Chris? I have to, I have to go, guys. But, oh, cool. But I will so see you later. Thank okay. You, all right. Bye. So let's just go back to the questions. We've got a good question from Mad Cotto. He says, what right does the USA have over everyone's coins from the Silk Road? Many of these people were not in the USA, and what they bought may or may not be illegal in their country. So it is unfortunate that these people's coins were caught with the uh, other Silk Road coins. Let's see. Let's try that. Chris, go ahead. What, what right do the USA have to sell anyone's coins? Well, the thing is that these aren't Umbrex coins. These are the the coins that were on the, the Silk Road itself. So I think the feds are just following standard procedure here um, by the looks of it. So I, I don't know. I, I don't think they have a right to sell them either. But I mean, I think the Silk Road was a business in their jurisdiction. And so since it's a business that's in their jurisdiction, they didn't like the way it's operating, so they have the rights to what the business had. 
uh, is what they would probably say. That's probably the legal reason. Uh, so you have some more comments from Donation Coin. He says, we're the same with Donation Coin in Africa, and it's so difficult and hard to communicate easily with the people there because they do not have internet connections. So it is an issue on the ground. And, yeah, uh, it's, also, it's also a cultural thing as well. Like you're going to go to a group of people that haven't even barely got used to dumb phones, let alone smartphones, and you're going to get them to hold private keys on their on their devices and things like that. It's just like they, a lot of people in, in certain parts of Africa, and obviously when we say Africa, we're talking about an entire continent, not a country here. But there are lots of regions where kids don't even have lights to, to, to be able to study in the evenings and the nighttime because, you know, that's how poor they are. The idea that you're going to get this, you know, what are we up to now, 20 gigabyte blockchain, this file that's going to have to be downloaded? Because you're not what you're not going to be able to do is you're not going to be able to outsource this to you know, people like Safaricom, because they'll just rinse the, the population for fees. It's got to be distributed at the core. I actually think that something like CoinPunk, you know, what Kyle Drake is working on, um, CoinPunk, maybe you could get that up, Tom. Um, a cool idea, you could use a, like a blockchain wallet where it would be on your phone, but it would take the Bitcoins yeah. out of the wallet on your home computer. Uh, it was a project. So, he, so, so here's here's a suggestion for donation coin, and thanks very much for reaching out to me as well on Twitter the other day. So I didn't see your comment straight away because lots of people were tweeting funny pictures of me looking like Abraham Lincoln. So this is Coin Punk, and here's my suggestion. Here's what we wanted to do at Feathercoin, and we we might still do it at Feathercoin. Um, it was my idea originally was that you would go out to to a region in Africa where you already knew. Some, some people there, maybe you had some expats who were friends that were from that particular region, and you would go, you would go to a community and you'd say to that community, right, who among you is the most trusted person here? Who, who would you, you know, trust your life with, all your life savings? There's usually someone in a village anywhere in the world that you can rely on like that. You go to that person, okay, and you spend as much time as you need to spend with them, and you teach them how to use this technology at a very basic level, and you stay there with them, you give them access to resources, you, you, you give them you know, somewhere they can go, maybe a forum or a special support group that they can go to when anything goes wrong, and you get them to set up a, a CoinPunk server for the whole village, right? They end up becoming the local blockchain.info for their whole village, and you let them have access to whatever coin they want. Basically, what you're doing is you're letting them price their sentiment into the global market, which is something that they currently don't have unless they go through seven layers of middlemen and people that want bribes along the way. But what you'd be doing is you'd be going there impartially. You'd be saying, right, you've got all these coins to choose from. You've got, you've got this little shibe. You've got this, this, this Japanese dog. You've got this weird one called Feather Coin. It's like kind of like from Oxford, you know. And you've got this Litecoin one. And you've got, you've got all these the donation coin, very coin. You've got all of these to choose from. And here are all the relative merits and the benefits and the drawbacks. Maybe you want to start your own one. But it basically lets you do you know, what, what you want it to do. And then the actual coins are stored with somebody locally and then they can just distribute it out over a mesh network. And what you do is you start it off as an experiment and the, the, the coins that they begin with are donated coins, right? So these are coins that you're giving them. You're not, you're not telling them to put any of their hard labor or any of their actual work into these coins. You're literally treating this like an experiment. You go to a university, you go to a research institution. I get regularly approached by students studying PhDs who want to interview me for their thesis, right? You won't be short of these people. You go to them and you say, look, we've tr we're trying this out. We haven't asked for anyone's permission. We literally just got onto a plane. We went to this village. We set them up with a CoinPunk server. They're, they're serving a, a local Bitcoin wallet and, and people have it on their, their phones or, or whatever. You give out some phones, you know, go to a charity, get some old phones off of them. And you go out there and you try it out. You take pictures, you video blog it, you tell the truth. You say, look, actually, we started this thing. It hasn't really worked out, but this is the problem we're finding. And then you get people over the internet to start giving you suggestions. Well, have you thought about doing this? I mean, look, it's all very well when we're talking about it. I mean, Richard did, did sort of try it. He said that he didn't have a lot of luck. There's obviously a very, very large landmass that you're talking about. People have to travel many, many miles every day to get the, the simplest of things done. But what I don't want to see is I don't want Bitcoin to end up being taken over by big business 
that you end up with this kind of managerial class, you know what I mean? Like that's actually a Marxist term, I don't mean it in a kind of Marxist way. I just mean like the same old people end up inheriting the wealth all over again when we had such a great opportunity at this point in history to turn things around. Like we actually had an opportunity to make those things more meritocratic, more bottom up, because this, this technology favours poor people much more than it does rich people. The, 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 and, and actually, you don't invest at the height of the market anyway. You invest where there's the most potential for growth. So anyway, rant over. <laughs> very good, very good. We've got another question from Twitter. They say, if Bitstamp is Coinbase's exclusive exchange partner, as the lockstep price suggests, would the fall of Bitstamp hurt Coinbase? I'm not sure they're officially partnered. The prices just seem to stick together. I think, um, I think Coinbase. Yeah, they actually they chose they chose to use um, them as the uh, they use Bitstamp as their base price. And I think they used to use Mt. Gox and they used to use a blended price. So Coinbase could probably just change to a different exchange or provider if Bitstamp went down. So temporarily there would be an issue. There'd be cheap coins like we saw with Gox. Uh, so I think that would be that. I don't think they're officially linked. I think it's just a uh, they needed somebody to base their price on, and they chose Bitstamp. If you look at the prices, um, BTC E is usually a little lower than the other prices, presumably because you can buy Litecoin and other coins on that exchange. Uh, otherwise, we don't have an exact reason for why that's happening. Um, I think it's because it's harder to get your money on there, I imagine, and also because it's a little bit dodgier, like we don't know the owners, stuff like that. But yeah, historically, it's always been cheaper. You're right. It was, it was always, sometimes it was like 10% cheaper. We've got a cool question, comment here. Uh, John Hannes from Skyhook, the Bitcoin ATMs, they're below $1,000. He writes in from Portland, Oregon. He says that Skyhook is working with Kyle to develop CoinPunk 2.0. Bitcoin JS is the key to this and other applications for browser-based decentralized wallets. It sounds very cool. Sounds like the project is continuing. Yeah. And um, perhaps the, uh, the Bitcoin machine that you're envisioning, Chris, could in somehow involve a Skyhook Bitcoin ATM so that if you took it to a town that had paper money and again that's a huge if I don't I don't I don't know the money conditions of Africa but if they have paper money and they had one of those exchange readers that could read it you could change some of your money into Bitcoin and maybe at the same time that machine that does that could run this coin punk server that you're talking about and and actually have the network for all these uh, phones to operate on the system so very cool yeah. stuff and I like the way that uh, you know these technologies that we use over here where we have Wi-Fi, we have networks, you know, we have fiber optic, we have all these kind of things, we take them and we bundle them up and then we take them somewhere like Africa where they have nothing and we try to unroll them in the same environment to try to get yeah. similar results and I think that's an incredible, it's, it's almost like a space program of bringing technology to them to try to improve their lives. I, I guess that feels kind of cultural but uh, it's still, it's, I still think it's great. Uh, cultural yeah, I mean, this is much about what we can learn as a community about them, about these regions of the world than it is about us just going like Starbucks or McDonald's and just dumping this technology on them. Because all we're doing is we're just exporting our culture all over the world. The world ends up all looking the same. Everywhere looks like America, and it just feels not, no no offense against Americans. It I'm going to be I'm so 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 great to see you in a couple of weeks. Please be kind to me. All, all of your old British habits are going to rest <laughs> now that you're visiting the colonies. I've got some <laughs> colonies. Can't do that one over there. Colonists don't like it. Or the split us. So we've got a, a good comment here from Donation Coin. He says that he has an issue talking to non-developers. That even things that are simple, like a pre-mine, gets completely misunderstood. And he, he explains that people say, "How long did it take to mine the pre-mine?" When really, what he's saying is, if the coin's designed right, the first block is a super block and it could contain millions of coins and you wouldn't have to expend a bunch of energy or effort to pre-mine the coin. So that's an interesting point that he brings up. It's often well, there's, a different, there's a difference between an insta-mine and a pre-mine. So yeah, the, the pre-mine is where a group of people get together and they don't tell anyone about the coin and then they mine it very, very quickly in the early days at near zero difficulty. That's what Feathercoin got accused of doing. Um, but then again, the problem is that how do you fairly launch a coin anyway? Because short of telling the whole world, like every single citizen on the planet of this plan, 
and giving every single person. I'm told like, that's what Litecoin did. Litecoin went around and told everyone personally. Well, no, they didn't. And the thing is, it's like, oh, so yours is, so instead of being, you know, 2% fair, yours was 2.5% fair. It, it, it's ridiculous. Why don't you just make yourself relevant to a community? This is why I'm saying, like, when you go to these places in Africa or maybe at Western China or South America, you need to give them educated decisions. You need to be able to say, look, here's what's on offer already. Here's what the rest of the world has already come up with. But you might disagree. And here's why, because having this number of coins has this impact. Having this deflationary aspect has this impact. Why doesn't your community either adopt one that you already find good and familiar, or create your own one and let the market decide which one gets to the whole point of the market system was that we're supposed to arrive at the best currency, not go out opining and like, you know, telling everyone what we think is a shit coin or what isn't a shit coin. It's like, well, who are you to decide? All you're doing is expressing an opinion, but that's why we have markets to make that kind of thing discoverable. So, you know, do you, if you don't like what you already see, do your own thing and try it out and see what works because you can't notify the entire planet of your intentions to make sure that it's fair. You're never going to get the whole world to agree on what's fair. And that's, that's why what a lot of people are talking about here in the Twitter feed. They're talking about how to invest and that sometimes investing means buying when other people are selling and that you have to trust your own opinion, your own research, and you have to stick with what you stick to your guns. And if you don't have that strong hand, and also if you see something, you have to change your mind. So you have to do both those things. And I'm not sure if everyone's doing that today. But uh, let's go ahead and check in with the price of Bitcoin. Let's see what's going on. Go out to screen share here. The price of Bitcoin is $585. We're looking at the one day view, and you can see a very small green candle tacked onto the end of that red. Let's zoom in here to the 12 hour. See if we can get that green candle to blow up a little. Let's see what's going it's on. A, it's called a dead cat bounce. <laughs> oh, don't so, say that. that that's not going to last. That is not going to last. Look at the volume on it. Yeah. Look at the volume cool. down at the bottom. Yeah. So I should go sell? That's what you're saying? No, I'm not telling you to sell. I'm not telling you to buy either. I'm, I'm, you need to make your own decision. You need to stop looking to other people to make your mind up and just have a thesis, have a belief, and then work on that conviction. Like, just own your own trades, own your own decisions, and don't be outsourcing it. The reason I don't trade is because it's a mugs game. If I did, I'd have to spend all my time looking at the charts. I'd have to, I mean, I pour through the forums anyway, but only because I like, you know, the stories and the people and stuff. But the thing is, you always get caught out. The only people that win are the exchanges, the middlemen who get all the fees and all the transmission fees you pay the bank to send the money in and, and so on. And also there are tax implications that I think a lot of people are overlooking is that, you know, in a year or two, the tax men are going to come around. They're going to say, well, look, I saw you on Twitter bragging about your Bitcoin holdings. Um, we can use the blockchain to look this up. So why don't we cut the crap? Why don't you just come clean and you're going to have to give them an entire audit of every single trade you make. And in some jurisdictions, they actually you have to pay tax on account. So even if you lost money, you're still going to have to pay taxes on that. And I think secretly, a lot of people, you know, just aren't aren't realizing that this is um, this is actually going to be a problem for them. That they thought they could just kind of you know trade this thing and it was all kind of unofficial and maybe I can go to another country or something like that. But it's not going to work. I think the tax man is going to come calling, especially in the UK. All right, we've got a couple more questions here. Going back to the questions and answers, I'll just bring up this chart for a little while. Uh, Chris Johnson says that the whole pre-mine thing doesn't really matter in the long term. Bitcoin, for example, will be 90% pre-mined as far as 90% of the population con is concerned because by the time they get into it, it'll be mined already. Right. So yeah. So it's in, it's insta mind. Yeah. So so it's just that a very small group of people did it, and he's right. That's absolutely correct. And there's nothing you can do about it. Absolutely nothing. So don't worry about it. Like obviously, if someone has deliberately gone out and in, and with the intention of defrauding people, and they pre mined it, and they've held it back, and they haven't told you their intentions, and they haven't discussed what the pre mine is going to be for, and all this kind of thing 
then yeah, obviously that that is a scam. And I actually generally prefer no pre mine on on any coin, just because I prefer energy to have been expended on those coins. The thing I love about Bitcoin so much is that those coins are backed by energy and time. So they were never free in the first place. The biggest problem with the banking system is that you've got a whole bunch of men in suits typing numbers into spreadsheets, calling those numbers valuable, and then trying to persuade the rest of us they're valuable by threatening us with legal action and, and you know incarceration if we don't you know if we don't abide by it. So I, I, that's the only reason I don't like a pre-mine is because no energy was sacrificed in making the coins in the first place. We've got a follow-up a comment from John Hannes of Skyhook ATM. He says that they can do better than the traditional client-server model with Skyhook slash CoinPunk 2.0. They can have the wallet hosted solely in the browser. The only need for a server is getting unspent outputs and publishing signed transactions. That sounds very cool from the Skyhook people. So check that out. That's what I like. Is that it? Bring it. It brings autonomy to the individual, so that you have that power. And of course, with that power, you're going to have to have a lot of, as they say, responsibility. <laughs> so really, this is an educational exercise. This is about going out to people and educating them about the full stack of Bitcoin, not just the, the the Bitcoins and the tokens that sit on top of the network, but also the protocol, the network, its implications, what this means for you as an individual, and just very, very slowly get them in with coins that you've given them, that you've donated to them, get them to start sharing it with their friends, get them to, to report back to you with their feedback. I think we need more UX designers in this space, okay? We need more usability experts who are going to be able to come in and are going to be able to design nicer user interfaces. It's not just the interface either, it's also the actual flow that you go through, the information hierarchy, how you present that information to your user, um, how you kind of force them through down certain corridors of usability so that you get them to perform best practices as a, as a basis of habit rather than something they kind of grudgingly have to do as a chore. Yeah, I mean, it looks really good. We've got the Skyhook ATM at projectskyhook.com, and you can get one of these for less than $1,000. It sounds very cool. I'd like to get one. I could take it with me to Bitcoin meetups and have people trade me dollars for Bitcoins. Be pretty neat. Um, we've got another question here from Donation Coin Cryptocurrency, and he says, that's why the community, all miners and traders, need to be shown which coins have really bad or unknowledgeable developers. And this can be seen so easily by a trained person like himself or Chris Ellis could look at GitHub. I've seen some websites that are like programmer report cards, where it analyzes the GitHub contributions of the programmer and attempts to make some scores and some judgments out of them. Maybe if we could get these report cards for all of the developers of all of the altcoins, we could have some kind of metric to use to judge them. Uh, the other issue there is going to be your anonymous developers. Obviously, they're not going to show up on, well, I guess maybe if they have aliases, they'd show up on GitHub, but generally, I wouldn't expect them on GitHub. And it's going to be harder to uh, track and compare their their value. And uh, you know that's generally true with unnamed anonymous things. It is harder to prove their value. So. Yeah, GitHub plays a big role in it. I don't know that those metrics are all that accurate because you can't get a computer to tell the quality of the code. Um, you're also going to need things like time measurement. So the, the, the developer is going to have to track their time on their personal computer. Um, and you're going to need to have some kind of reputation system on the community side. So the community members are going to have to come in. I'd quite like to see a coin implement a pro tem uh, leadership role. Um, I would like to see this at Feathercoin. I've already suggested that there are a couple of people that are currently setting up a, a Trello work board at the moment to, to see if they can implement that. The way it would work is that the titles, like things like lead developer or you know head of publicity, go to the people that do the work, and they're not pre-announced. So you don't just get given a title. Um, because as we've seen with these open source projects, is because no one's getting paid, no one feels obliged to work, and so as soon as they see the price go down, they kind of get, oh, I get a bit bored, they go work on some other coin that's getting popular. So what we've said is like, okay, uh, what's been proposed anyway is like, whoever does the most work, wh whoever has done the most work over the last three months, you get the, the title of, you know, this, the, the best developer or whatever. So then it's kind of meritorious, and then everyone's incentivized, and you can have addresses for the projects that can be crowdfunded, and people can give money 
um, to that person for doing for actually delivering that work on a pro tem basis on an ad hoc pro tem basis. Very cool. We have some more information from Skyhook. They're sending us uh, pictures of their customer and operations panel. So we're going to go ahead and load these up and take a look at them, and uh, maybe we can help uh, judge the usability. Although we're just uh, we're looking at some sample shots here. So let's see. The first sample shot we've got um, how to boot up. Configuration settings, reconfigure. Uh, looks like there's a couple more shots. Oh, there's 19 images. So the admin login, count configurations. Uh, so this is good stuff. It's very readable. Password didn't load. Count configuration, and then looks like we have the actual operation of the Bitcoin ATM as well. An optimistic price these days. It's funny. You used to think <laughs> The apps used to have a price where it would be, oh, that price is so old, it's embarrassing, it's $12 a coin, and now we're at the same thing with the $1,000 Bitcoin. But uh, still, we can be optimistic. So you insert bills, it's going to send the Bitcoins to this address, and then it says processing, and then the transaction is complete. So it looks pretty cool, very straightforward. They've got a how to get Bitcoin wallet thing here. So good stuff from the Skyhook people. Chris, what do you think? Yeah, it looks very good. I'm definitely going to be researching this a bit more after the show. <laughs> very cool. Uh, let's see, do you want to go through the price again? Anything you want to go over right now? Well, we were talking earlier on Twitter um, about the fact that most people don't want the Bitcoins, and that is, I think, one of the biggest problems uh, that we have at the moment is that a lot of people on these exchanges, they don't really want Bitcoins. What they want is dollars and they're using bitcoins to generate more of them and that's why we're seeing this problem. Now somebody uh, DBTC1999 on Twitter has just replied to my comment, uh, he's probably not watching this video uh, because he's just reading it on Twitter, has said and people that trade stocks and commodities most of them don't want either so what he's saying is yeah but isn't it the same with stocks and commodities um, people don't actually want those, what they want is the, the, the dollars it generates and that's absolutely true so let's take stocks first. Stocks are, are generative, there are actual human beings working in an office or delivering something of value to the market so what you're receiving, what you're investing in there is you're, you're deliberately not investing in a currency you're actually in investing in a group of people that are delivering some economic output to the economy, they're, they're taking one thing at a certain price and they're selling it for more to, to another group of people and that is a perfectly worthy investment if the, if the company is good and you want to see them grow the, 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 there's no reason why you would want to spend those stocks um, as, as currency, there's a, that's absolutely a, a viable thing. Now as commodities I do actually take issue with people who just spend like, well the, I don't take issue with the people, I, I take a, a issue with the industry that tries to promote this, this kind of commodities trading without taking inventory or responsibility for, for that commodity because then all, then all you're doing is, spec, is just speculating and all you're doing is looking at candlesticks, you're not associated to the people, it's not like 17th century Osaka Japan where the forward contract originally comes from where everybody in the village knew each other, right? So the farmer wasn't sure whether he could take a risk on the weather, he wasn't sure whether he should sow his crop this season, a speculator would come along and said look I understand the risks you face but we all need you to grow your crop or the whole village is going to starve. So I'll tell you what I'll do, I'll buy your grains off of you for an agreed price in two months time and that way it shields you from that volatility and then it works for everyone. But if you think about it, the, the global um, stock markets are actually a product of efficiencies in communication, it actually largely comes out of the development, technological developments from the Babbage machine, World War One, World War Two. it's kind of a coincidence and we've sort of just sleepwalked our way into this world, into this culture where it's perfectly okay to beggar thy neighbour, to dump a bunch of worthless currency in exchange for precious fresh water or gold or whatever it is that really is finite and I just give you a, a chunk of my money and then as soon as I've given you the money and I've taken receipt of the water that finite stuff, I then go and print some more money, like nobody's falling for this and the only reason it hasn't crashed so far is because all the countries are doing it and so relatively speaking they're all going down in value relative to one another and so we don't really notice it at the moment. So in the case of Bitcoin, if our outcome is to make this an actual usable currency where people actually have it on them, they, go, they leave the house every morning with it, they buy food, they buy fuel, 
they, they spend it on things that actually matter, you're not going to be able to do that if 80%, well maybe that's exaggerating, what would you say Tom, maybe 70% of your people leave all their coins on the exchange and immediately place sell orders immediately after they buy, which a lot of them do. They buy, they buy it when they think it's going down and then they deliberately put a sell order 20% above where they bought it from and they just leave it there. And then they spend all their time like trying to work out what the price is going to do. Meanwhile, they could actually be doing something with their lives. Like they could actually be going out, like I don't know, just building stuff, digging stuff out of the ground, serving homeless people, food to homeless people, anything. Um, but it it just feels very degenerate. It does doesn't feel like it's very generous. So yeah, you are right. Stocks and commodities, people don't want those either. But I do feel like there's more going on with those. Whereas with Bitcoin, the whole point of it is it should be used as a currency. I guess that is my point. <laughs> very good. And we do have another update from Project Skyhook. They're open sourcing their whole ATM. And I recall them talking about this before. They uh, they agreed that. Um, they're okay with no one making any more profit in the Bitcoin ATM market. They're okay with that going open source, and if someone can make cheaper hardware than what they've made, uh, they're in favor of that. So it sounds like a very cool company over there at Skyhook. So everyone should check that out. That does look very cool. I'm going to have to check that out. And, and again, while we're uh, you know on the subject, if the Skyhook company would like to sponsor Chris Ellis's trip mm -hmm. to Washington, D.C., we would be glad to accept bitcoins, even with the price down to the uh, trip to DC. Uh, Mad Bitcoins has a similar uh, contest where he will wear your T-shirt. So Skyhook, if you have a very bright colored T-shirt, the word Skyhook on it, you know, I'll wear your T-shirt. I'll talk about your company. Uh, all we need is some money for travel uh, for myself and for Mr. Ellis, who will wear these stylish David Bowie. No. No, I won't. Well, I will not be wearing that. But I am happy to um, get to know the guys at Skyhook a little bit better because from what I've heard so far, sounds very, very um, appealing. Sounds exactly like the kind of project I'd want to uh, be endorsing. I like, you know, Tom, you know, we, we should maybe spend some time talking about our intentions with World Crypto Network. Like, we really believe in this thing. The, the idea behind World Crypto Network is that it's the world's first independent rolling news channel. Um, that we cover, like we cover the news from the people, the real people. There's no, well, virtually no editorial pro process other than you've got to be sane in order to be on here. I think that's the only like prerequisite we really have. Um, so we do, we do want to get some sponsors, but we kind of want those sponsors to be good people. We want to, we want to make sure we're representing the best, like you know, from from the ground up. So any of these kind of like open source. Um, ATMs, donation coin, all of that stuff, absolutely. That's definitely the kind of thing that we want to be promoting. Absolutely. And uh, I don't know, we're just, if anyone wants to do a show out there, the idea is basically if you do a weekly show, it's really hard to get people's attention. So at World Crypto Network, you can do a weekly show on your own for a couple of weeks, get used to it, get some practice shows in. And then if you want to put your show on the network, We'll just put your show right in, and it'll get you a couple hundred views right away, which gives you a chance to get some feedback, to improve your show, and just to keep doing it. Because it's really just about starting to do shows and then keeping to do shows. Everyone just keeps doing them and having the right intentions, right? So, and you know, in general, like the Mad Bitcoin show, I started because I wanted to talk about Bitcoin every day. I wanted to try to help explain it to people. Uh, there didn't seem to be anyone doing that. And I just wanted to, you know, try to do that. So if you feel the same way about your altcoin or about a certain part of Bitcoin or a certain part of the future of Bitcoin, and you want to talk about it, get yourself a webcam, get yourself a microphone, and get to it. Because new people are coming on board every day. We're open to new shows, and uh, we're just trying to get the word out there. And there's always new news and information happening, as we've seen today. No one knew that we were going to be discussing the Silk Road sale. I think it had been rumored, I'd heard talks about it, and now it's here. So that uncertainty has been removed from the market. Uh, last year it kind of felt like Mt. Gox was going to go down, the Silk Road was going to go down, and now that's all happened. So this year's uncertainty, when will the government sell their Silk Road money? How will the government sell their Silk Road money? That's now been revealed to us. And Like Chris says, we just have to wait 24 hours for the rest of the market to absorb this information. For all we know, when they get this information in China, they're going to go on a huge buying spree. They're going to say this is a, a good deal and it's cheap, uh, although unfortunately it's probably more likely 
they'll think that the price will go down with more bitcoins on the market. So it's very happening. So. Well, think think about it this way. So a lot of this is about anticipating other people and and judging their behavior before they've had time to do it. No one in their right mind is going to buy 3,000 or more coins from the feds and then just dump them onto the exchange. If their exit strategy longer term is to convert the bitcoins into into fiat, in other words, if they're just buying the, the coins off of them, remember that they're going to be competing in a market where other people are going to be thinking the same thing. So if everyone goes in to buy the coins from the feds with the intention of selling it to fiat, in theory, provided the feds don't screw it up, the, the market should balance out to price in that sentiment. At the same time, the public markets, which at the moment are, are much more um, liquid and we can see them, they're much more visible, we're getting real-time in, information. Everyone's now trying to judge what they think other people are going to do. So they're not thinking about what the, what the buyers from the feds are going to do. They're thinking about what other players in the same market as them, what price they think will be a fair one to see the introduction of these coins when, when they eventually reach there. But if you're someone that's bought them off of the feds, you're not going to want to dump them all in one go. You're probably going to want to, to sell them off very, very gradually and slowly, which actually makes me think that probably no one's going to buy them off the feds wanting to convert them straight into dollars because by the time the market has squeezed out all the efficiencies as we've said by the time the, the market on um, the public exchanges has gone down maybe five hundred four hundred dollars then why would they they would have no incentive to do it anymore it just wouldn't be worth their while they've got to wire what was it two hundred thousand dollars to this thing like it's it's, it's going to be more likely, I think Max Kaiser did a post earlier on, like it's more likely going to be a venture fund or somebody that's got a, a Bitcoin strategy with the companies that they've invested in or companies that they plan to start. That, that, would, be the best, that would be the best play. We, we do know the two largest players in the sphere, the Winklevi ETF and the second market ETF, are both trying to buy as many Bitcoins as they can. And this is an obvious example for them to get in on this. So I, I'm pretty assured that they'd be in on the sale. Um, as for the other players, we don't know, and I'm not sure if we're going to know, but I mean, we have a brand new a... entry in the Chris Ellis Photoshop contest. This is from Sovereign Monkey. He says, this is the Bitcoin Avenger. Donate. And as you can see, this is Chris Ellis's face in the Captain America mask from the new movie with an awesome Bitcoin shield. So great job, Sovereign Monkey. And I'll That's bet that, cool. that QR code probably just goes right to the old donation address. So if you're watching... We better this, check it, actually. We better check, check that nobody's it. trying it on. <laughs> okay, we're, we're going to go ahead and go right to the donation address. We have 10 transactions for a total of $16 million, $909,075.06. A grand total of 29,000, you guessed it, 658 bitcoins. Chris Ellis, you just got donated Ross Ulbricht's Dead Private Roberts Bitcoin. <laughs> what are you going to do next? <laughs> don't show them that. That's the wrong address, dude. This is, yeah, don't donate to that account. That would go to the government. Yeah. You'd oh, be donating straight to the government. But the actual <laughs> account, unfortunately... And that is funny. You can donate to Dread Pirate Roberts if you'd like as a lark. That's my but, one. But we have 27 donors, which is awesome. And let me change the money. 2.59 Bitcoin. Very cool. From now on, we're only keeping track of this in Bitcoin. Our goal was around 6 Bitcoin, so we're almost halfway there, uh, regardless of this goofy price nonsense. But uh, you can donate to this address on your screen. This is not the Dread Pirate Robert address, so we're back on board. <laughs> but that other one was good, huh? I was flipping through my tabs, and I was like, $16 million. This isn't our account. <laughs> that would be I, cool, though. I had to do a little double take. I was there at first. So. That would be cool if some, like, you know, just some early adopter of Bitcoin just was following you and me on Twitter and just thought, hey, I really like these guys. They do these great live streams. I mean, I just really, I don't know. I made a couple of billion. More and more. Oh, I don't, I don't think there are any early adopters. I think they were all robots or computer programs uh, drafted. One by who? What, did they program themselves? Dude, they were owned by someone. There were loads of people. I know people that have made loads of money on Bitcoin. I've never met any. 
they do exist. We've had quite a few at the London Bitcoin meetup. We had the guy who bought the um, ten thousand dollar pizza. So this was the guy turned up to the London Bitcoin meetup. I wasn't there, but I got told about it afterwards. And he was the guy that bought the pizza, not spent the coins. So someone gave him the coins to buy the pizza with, because the the coins didn't actually go to the pizza place. They went to the guy in the middle. And uh, yeah, and he still got them. He still got them. That's a lot of a lot of pizza he could be buying. If you're so out just... there, Bitcoin pizza man, consider donating yeah. to Chris Ellis. Let me put the address up again because I'm it's sure the pizza guy's like reaching for his wallet. He's like, I'm going to take care of those guys right now. I just, I, it's just one of those things you're going to do, isn't it? It's just one of those things you're going to do at the spur of the moment. You're just going to go, I'm going to do this now before I change my mind. I'm just going to give these guys $16 million <laughs> just now, just right now. I'm just going to do it. Before I change my mind, I'm just going to send it right now. And they're just going to go, whew, thank God I just, thank God I just did that. <laughs> it will be good. And remember, a lot of people, the, the Dread Pirate Roberts had a lot of Bitcoin. And look where they all went. He had allegedly yeah. 29,000 of his own Bitcoin. And as far as I know, he was living in San Francisco using the Wi-Fi at the public library. So uh, if you got it and you can't use it, give it to a charity. And if you've got it, maybe you should use it too. Have a little fun. So especially if you've been, um, you know, including Bitcoin miners into computer programs or stealing from other people's wallets. I mean, where are all those Bitcoins going? Lifestyles of the rich and Bitcoin criminal. I'd like to hear uh, more stories from them. They're keeping it all quiet. At least that's what it seems right now. <laughs> but uh, you know, that stuff always comes out. They they love to talk. So, so you know what you know what I'm thinking is you were talking about the Winklevi. Uh, the Winkle bosses, as I call them, and um, this would be a great PR move for them. I think for them and maybe Max Kaiser and a few other big players in this market, for them to come out in the next few days and say, right, we're officially putting in some buy orders, that will make their stock go up a lot. Because if people people know that they're buying them, they know particularly with Max Kaiser, you know, he's been around since the beginning. He's the guy that did that video, like I think it was like two or three years ago, from New York City, where he was on that kind of that balcony with Stacy, and he was screaming out like, "Satoshi Cyber Christ, he's coming down!" Like I remember actually watching this thing and being totally taken in and mesmerized by the whole thing. Like, how could someone be so angry and so like visceral? And the, you know, someone like him, if he buys the coins, or someone he knows, or he does a deal, that will send a very, very powerful bullish signal to the market because you know that those people have the interest of Bitcoin at heart over the long term. So actually, in a funny sort of way, this very move provides an incentive for someone like that to make that kind of play and turn it into a PR, a PR move. It would be a great move. Weeklevi, think about it. We've also got another PR move from Skyhook Bitcoin ATM. They say, how much for one of you to wear a honey badger outfit with a Skyhook ATM strapped to your chest like a baby Bjorn? <laughs> I'll consider it. Uh, uh, 2.7 2. Bitcoins? It quite, it costs quite a lot of money to get him over here from the UK. We're estimating it at around 3,000. Uh, about 1,000 to get me there. So if that happened, we'd stop talking about fundraising altogether. But well, it's a, it's not though, because the thing that the 3,000, even if I raise the 3,000, that only really pays for DC and the accommodation. But you're also talking about going to Porkfest and all of this other stuff. So there's I mean, a lot of cities that you might visit. It's going to expand a lot. I think we've got to keep this quite fluid, Tom. I think we've got to make this like, okay, so I'll, I'll definitely fly out with what what we've got so far because I can probably uh, afford that. And all I, all I want to be sure is that I break even, I don't spend any money because I've been going to way too many of these conferences. It's just costing me a fortune. It's not sustainable. So what I'm happy to do is I'm happy to go out there, let's make some videos, let's get some real-time feedback from our community and from the, from the people on the ground and actually see like, okay, you know, how much do you like this? Do you want to see this carry on? What could we do better? Do you want us to get some new microphones? Or, you know, some, you were talking earlier about getting some stereo mics, things like yeah, that. Yeah, my microphone's not very good. It's a mono like, mic. Let, let's get, like, I'm thinking, because, like, I want to do my show, and, like, lots of people have come to me with feedback, and what I wanted to do with my one is I actually want it to be shaped by the people that have... Um, you know, come to me over the last few months and said, look, I really like what you do. And I didn't want to just do the same old 
you know, stuff that I'd always done. So at the moment, all I'm doing is these kind of spontaneous videos every now and again. If it, if it's relevant, people seem to be liking that. I'm getting lots of followers on Twitter, like maybe 20 a day, um, new followers, and, and that's all really good. But I'd really like maybe when we're in, when we're in DC, we'll really get to cut our teeth because we'll be all together for the first time. Like you know, you, Christoph, uh, Megan, everyone. Um, is Will coming as well? Yeah, he is, yeah, isn't he? Will's coming. Will will be there. Davi will be there. Andrea should be Andreas, there. Andreas, yeah. Be joined by uh, Stephanie Murphy from Let's Talk Bitcoin. Great. I, I love Stephanie as well. I really want to want to meet her. So once we've got like everyone there, it'll be a real kind of test to see like, okay, what can we produce? We've actually been sent proper money this time. So this will be like our first time actually being paid and accountable and like we're going to feel so bad if we don't do this properly. So we better get it right. And well, when we do I've it... Had some, I've had some practice recently. I did the uh, bowling video and the Jason King oh, yeah. video back to back in San Francisco. So if you want to see what it'll look like, it'll probably look like that. Um, we're kind of like we're kind of like the Beatles, Tom. Do you remember the Beatles were like, you know, oh, just another guitar band. We're not interested, you know. And they had to go through quite a few record companies, and eventually it was Decca, you know. And um, so that's what we're looking for, you know. We've got to do all these gigs. We've got to we've got to we've got to play the circuit. We've got to do that. We've got to do. <laughs> we've got to go to Berlin and, and do like an underground kind of. Club. We're going to play the cavern club. Yeah. We're never going to be able to leave. We're going to have to play we've, covers every night. Like musicians strapped to a barge. Yeah, and we and we've still got Pete Best on the drums. Ringo hasn't joined yet, um, so you know we've still we've still got some uh, some more team members to join us. But I think it'll be good because I feel like we we are the new sort of uh, indie media now. Like there was a time when Max Kaiser was the indie media, but now he's becoming kind of mainstream. Um, so he's getting a lot of like appearances on mainstream TV, and that's kind of cool because it makes more room for people like you and me, who are just real people, and we're not doing this to sell anything. We haven't particularly got an agenda to push. I'm always willing to be persuaded. I think the people that have reached out to me know that they're not my fans really; they're just my friends. Like every like that's exactly it. Like we're just friends on Twitter and Facebook. The only difference is that I'm the one that actually is stupid enough to get in front of a camera and put his legal identity on all the things that he says. And people do um, feel that when they when they meet us, they say nice things like, I feel like I know you because I watch your videos. And yeah. you know, I don't feel the same thing looking at the camera right now, but I do feel the same thing because I watch these videos too. I mean, I watch all of my videos back. I watch the Mad Bitcoins ones. And the reason I created that show or this show is because I wanted to watch them. I thought it would be fun to watch a show that was about Bitcoin because that's what I was into. And part of this new media that we're doing really is made possible by Bitcoin. In the past, we couldn't take this kind of risk because there was really no money out there, like literally no money. Like someone would send you a check in the mail. I don't. It, sending a $20 bill, putting it in an envelope, mailing it to me, that seems almost impossible. But in the world we live in now, people have donated $20 in Bitcoin to me before. It's a, you know, it's a good donation. It's great when it happens. But uh, you know, they don't have to put it in an envelope. They don't even have to get a stamp. It's really amazing. So. But what's really cool about it is that we're now converting our bitcoins into social capital. Like when people um, like Sovereign Monkey here, like he's actually spent time on this, and it really, really shows that that he actually cares about this and that he's doing this for another person. This is actually building up reputation. It's building up social capital. And what you're no like you see how the difference is. Like when you start working for a company, nobody nobody's allowed to talk about what they're paid. Like every nobody's allowed to like compare what they're getting paid to other members of staff, and you've kind of got this zero sum culture, where the incentives very quickly become all about like how you can avoid doing the work. Um, so you just want to be able to be able to do as little as possible for as much as possible. And if you know you're already going to get paid, then you know that that money's in the bag, and so then you look for every opportunity to skive. You start to get you start to get good at knowing when the boss isn't around. You start to get good at knowing, like you know, which part of the office is best to kind of disappear and be it's quiet. It's like in. you've been watching me at my old job, Chris. Don't describe my behavior so so neatly. 
No, but this is this is exactly how the economy works. Sorry, my camera keeps breaking every time I go to screen share. So this is exactly how the economy works, is that we are going from this kind of hidden culture where everyone wants to hide, no one wants to stand out, no one wants to be at the top of the employee league table, nobody wants to be at the bottom, we all kind of want to be in the middle somewhere because I don't want anyone to notice and I want my safe, cushy little number here, to an economy where it's going to be impossible for you to disappear. Like, it's not just easier to be discovered than ever ever before. You're not going to have a choice. The light is going to shine on you. Like, what do you think all this cryptography is about? What, what is happening here is the amount of witnessing action is increasing. We are seeing more and we are experiencing more than we have ever had before. As a civilization, we've got more history than we've ever had before. I mean, what do you think Christoph was doing last night and also uh, Vic, Rick Valkaridge, am I saying that right? You know, when I went to um, the conference in Amsterdam, the reason I didn't go to too many of the talks was because largely, well, A, because I knew I could watch them on video afterwards and I wanted to hang out with people and stuff, but also because a lot of it, I just felt like I was listening to yet another person's interpretation of history. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that after a while, it's like, well, look, all you're doing is talking to yourself. Like, you're just, you're just telling your own story. I mean, one of the things that defines our age is that anyone can do that now. So, I, what, so what I'm trying to contrast here is I like it when Christoph does it, because when Christoph does it, he's not, he's not like on a big platform. He doesn't have a major agenda. He's not trying to get you to buy his wares. And, you know, if you do this, the stock of his company is going to go to the moon. But sometimes I feel like with these big... Um, kind of speaking gigs, usually someone's got like a whole career set up, like they've actually got a company and it's got some stocks in it, they've got a product that they're selling but they're not really selling it but they kind of are selling it and they don't tell you exactly, you know, all the, all the different incentives but really they're doing what you, what you should be doing already which is looking through this story, reading this narrative and telling your own story and comparing it to what your friends think and, and building that narrative and actually working out like how can I make a contribution to all of this? Where do I fit into this picture? You know, What is it that I wanted to do or I wanted to be as a kid until society told me what I was supposed to do instead? Like recapture that, ask yourself what you always wanted to be and then ask yourself about what is the current situation and how, how you sort of fit into that and like, what are you putting off all of the time? How are you procrastinating? Um, I feel, I feel like, I feel like right now, modern culture, like we've got no time anymore. Like the present moment has just been. That was actually a really good quote. That um, chap from I forget his name now. He's from uh, Aberdeen, I think, in Scotland, and he's a he's a feather coiner. He's on the feather coin forum quite a lot, and he sent that link to that uh, video, Cosmopolis, and. Um, the actress, you know, she said this wonderful line. She said, I think she said something like, the corporations have just sucked out the present moment. With all this news and all this checking, you know, constant pinging of your emails and your Twitter account, you're always available to all this mass of people. You're always being checked on. Someone's always trying to work out what your state is, a little bit like the neutrino or the, the electron or the particle, right, the quantum physicists, always checking on their state, right? If you know anything about the quantum Zeno effect in... in particle physics, if you keep checking the state of something, it never changes, right? So if you keep checking on me, you keep checking on me, well, every time you check me, I haven't changed, man, because you keep fucking just back off, you know? So you do have to kind of unwind. You can get these things. I highly recommend um, these called mala beads, and Buddhists use them. Well, and lots of religious people use them. I use them when I meditate. I'm not religious. I'm just, I just meditate because I have to clear my head sometimes. And what you do is, when you breathe, Every time you take a breath, you roll a bead through your finger like that. And you take another breath and you switch all your phones off. Like I go to the woods like I did the other day because I had to just get away and just lie down and just listen to the birds and the trees and stuff. And I just pull another one through with every breath. And then when you get to the end of the beads, that's when you know when to stop. And what you're doing there is you're tuning yourself in to your own body's rhythm. You're not constantly at the mercy of external stimulus. So then you're just, I, I sort of feel like I'm recalibrating myself. You don't have to use these, I mean, you could use any tool. You're just basically trying to get your body to tell you when it's time to start and when it's time to stop. Monologue over. A meditation timer can also be helpful. We've got a couple more questions and answers here. We've got a good question from Infinite Radio. He writes, how long before we start going to virtual conferences? And then he talks about Oculus Tech and the 3D goggles that you can get. And he says the ridiculous travel costs are not really necessary. 
And uh, we are working on a virtual Bitcoin conference. It's going to be in the first or second week of August. We're working on planning it. And it's going to have all the speakers, vendors, and charities that you expect from a normal Bitcoin conference, except that it's going to be a series of Google Hangouts, much like this. And it's going to be completely free to anyone. There is a Bitcoin online summit going on right now. It's more of a, a monthly thing, like a month-long summit. This would be more of like a day-long conference, uh, all online, all live. And this month-long summit you have to pay for. So our conference will be completely free. So look for that in August. We are working on that. Actually, We're, taking donations. We're taking donations, surely. Sure. I mean, we'll probably take donations. We might be able to have sponsors. We may be able to give that money to the speakers for donating their time. Even though it is virtual time, they won't have to travel anywhere, uh, which should be convenient for everyone. And uh, we're talking to the speakers now, trying to get people together. We're supposed to be a meeting with them uh, about half an hour ago. But we're still rolling through. Hopefully, they're watching this. They know where I am. Uh, but we've got some good comments from Donation Coin. Uh, donation coins that says that they have the same ethics of, as Chris and that they fund all of the servers themselves. Their pool is a 0% fee and people can donate if they want and that donation also goes to charity and they're creating a sponsorship people for people to sponsor people worldwide with donation coin. So it sounds very interesting. They say they, they work 24-7 uh, on donation coin. It's a lifestyle choice. It's a revolution and a way to change the world. So I like what they're saying there. It's very hard to sell a new altcoin to someone. They're usually very jaded. I mean, even you know, you saw earlier with Vericoin, it was spelled V-E-R-Y instead of V-E-R-I, so it completely threw me off. Also, even coming from a good source like Bruno, who helped us with the logo, who's in Portugal, very cool guy, uh, it's still unsure. No one knows what the point of, of pushing a new altcoin is. So we do have to kind of sit back and let the, the price develop uh, let the features develop, but if you have good features and you have a, a good intention for your coin, I think it could turn out well, and I, I hope that Donation Coin does. And I, you know, just generally, I assume the idea is charity, and I support charity, so I think it should be a good coin. Chris, what do you think? Yeah, I think it sounds very good from from what I've seen. I, I just want to know like how how something like that could address the liquidity issue because it has to have more uses outside of its own. I mean, I'm t I take it that donation coin is a cryptocurrency in its own right. Is that am I right in saying that? We don't that, have the announcements in assume. front of us. It's it's tough to just right. speculate. But I mean, I assume it's a script based cryptocurrency, a copy of another one. I have no idea. Yeah. So the, what you've got to address there, and what we the same problem we have with Feathercoin is that you've got to generate enough um, market demand that is broad. So the, it can't just be the Feathercoin is used for tipping and nothing else, because that's not enough. People have to be able to buy food with it. They have to be able to buy beer, and they have to be able to do other things. So what we're focusing on is just getting it to work in the United Kingdom. Like we didn't go out and tell people we were trying to take over the world because we didn't want to overpromise. And so we're getting it working. We've got some open source point of sales that we're working on at the moment. In fact, they're actually finished and they're ready to go. And we're going to go up to Hull City in the UK and we're just going to get it working there. And we've said to Hull, if they want to do their own coin, that's perfectly okay. We'll help them do that. If not, that's okay too. They can use Feathercoin. It's whatever's right for them. And it's just really like, like, um, like we've said before on the show, you don't really know uh, how to secure something until something is at stake. So it's absolutely appropriate that this is a live market, that there are real participants with skin in the game. They've genuinely got something to lose. Otherwise, you're not going to learn anything. And so I think I think it's very good. I just think these, these single purpose coins, I think, are going to struggle for liquidity if that's all they're used for, when other coins will also be able to use for the same thing, plus a whole range of other things. So they'll presumably have more liquidity on the markets. But we'll see. You know, let's let's see how it goes. Our next question is from Infinite Radio. He says, "Be careful, guys! In the heart of the beast, with all the who's who of Bitcoin in one convenient place." Now, where's my tinfoil hat? Now, fortunately, we have taken steps. Uh, Derek J. Freeman will not be attending the Bitcoin in the Belt Beltway conference. So, if something does happen, Derek will become in charge of the World Crypto Network. Also, I've told that Adam B. Levine of Let's Talk Bitcoin will not be attending, so he will be in a safe location as well. So we have backed up some of your important big Bitcoin figures 
in case something happens. And remember, we'll always be here on YouTube until the end of time or until the end of YouTube, whichever comes first. I didn't know that our lives were at risk. Is that is that a serious? Uh... Yeah, this is more. You're just feeding into his America paranoia here. Right. Don't feed into his American paranoia. We very rarely get pepper sprayed in this country. <laughs> I I for one have never been tased despite being a bro. So it's it's dangerous, but it's not that dangerous. We've got lots more uh, questions, comments. We've got the. Uh, the announcement link for donation coin. Maybe we'll take a look. We might look at that offline. Uh, give it some more time, some respect to to learn about the coin. Um, sounds very cool. Let's see what else is going on. Still 29 uh, million, 29,000 bitcoins in that one wallet. But in the other wallet, we do have an update. We're now up to 28 donors. Yes, 2.7 bit. Wow. So we're Someone's... very close to halfway to our goal of six and very close to our goal of three. So thank you, donor number 0 0.11. Very cool to have you on board. So Yeah, it's 11 awesome. cents for Bitcoin. That's a lot. Thank you to whoever did that. It's very kind. Absolutely. Also, thanks to the 0 0.01, 0 0.009, and 0 0.5, all of the recent donations. Thank you for helping send Chris to America. It should be very exciting. Here's another uh, parody. That was my favorite one. It says, Chris Ellis is on a millibit highway headed west. America, watch out. Here comes Chris Ellis. And as you can see, the table is full of beers and full of girls with Chris Ellis at the center. Bitcoin. So it's all, it's, all, it's all about my cute British accent. I get a lot of feedback from that. A lot of people uh, say that. Yeah, I hope hopefully what I say with the accent is also good. <laughs> Yeah, it's no, I could, I could just be American and I just put the British accent on. Until until you show up here, we'll never know. That's yeah. another part of this, the whole face-to-face uh, -face thing. It's hard to keep up an accent like that for long if it's fake. That's true. true. I, my, my accent gets more British when I go to America, actually. <laughs> Usually I, I, I plumb it up a little bit because it works. It actually works a treat. You know, every restaurant you go into. <laughs> Let's see. Uh... Someone has a question and comment on Twitter. They say, I find this well-funded centralization of the coins worrying. Should I ignore it? I assume they're saying that the uh, the government's going to be selling them in 3,000 coin blocks, so this is your chance to own 3,000 bitcoins. Um, it's not that centralized. It's how, how percentage of the bitcoin? I guess there's 21 million bitcoins. So uh, the, well, the, the, the question is, is it going to be cheaper for you to buy on the speculation drop than it is to buy off the feds? So any, any would-be buyer has got to weigh that up. Now, they've already said you've got to send in $200,000 uh, to this address. So I wanted to send it to Bitstamp instead. I mean, right now the market's reacting. Like, I don't think anyone's going to be putting in bids uh, for, for the feds coins and not have simultaneous buy orders on a public exchange because they're going to want to, to arbitrage, they're going to want to play that, that market. So they're going to have $100,000 on Bitstamp and they're going to have whatever they're going to have with the Feds and if, the buy, if they don't get a price they like with the Feds they're just going to buy it on Bitstamp instead and, and, the, and the market's going to, to, be, to, to be working on the speculation in the meantime on all the forums and like we are on this video. We've got a, a great joke uh, comment from uh, Twitter. A sovereign monkey was watching uh, the show live, and uh, he or she saw, saw when we put up the uh, QR code, and then we went to the Dread Pirate Roberts. She thought that, or he or she, I don't know, they thought that they had put the DPR code on their Photoshop, and they were like, oh, no. It went to <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. Uh, I did actually, I did, I did start checking after you did that. I did check a few of them. They've all got the right QR code on them. Gladly, because <laughs> I, I did. Like, that made me think. Actually, yeah, we should probably check that that is the right. Before QR you retweet code. them, you have to check them because yeah, they're, yeah. they're collecting. They Photoshop this nice image for me, and they're collecting money for themselves. Yeah. Let's see. We also say they're missing more than 170 coins in the market. Now they have 170 more. Oh, I'm not sure what that's about. But um, let's see what else is going on. Looks like we have a new video coming out soon from This Week in Cryptos. 
Let's see. It looks like it's back on his original channel. So be sure to check it out. Friday the 13th. Robert is wow. back. And this is on the Tasty Licious YouTube channel. Tasty Licious does This Week in Cryptos. I'm not sure if you guys have been watching it, but we have this on the World Crypto Network now. It's one of my favorite shows. It features the Mad Puppet. He tells you what's going on in Bitcoin every week. Makes you laugh a little bit. It's great stuff. Not uh, This is on World Crypto, and it's on the Tasty Delicious channel, and not enough people are watching this, so watch This Week in Cryptos. It's funny stuff. So, Tasty Delicious. So what else is going on, Chris? That looks very cool. So we, oh, you haven't seen... I'm you haven't kind seen? of bothered by all this World Cup stuff. I'm really not into a bunch of blokes kicking a bit of leather around a field. I watched, I watched most of the... Uh, the uh, Brazil versus Croatia game today, the first game. I watched it in Spanish on Univision because ESPN wouldn't let me watch their feed without logging in through my cable company, which is not on their official list of cable companies, so I, I guess it must not exist. And um, there were there were three goals. He was very excited about the Brazil goals, and the rest of the time I tried to learn Spanish. I learned <laughs> rapido, like faster, and... Uh, I hear the word That's a key comes up all the time. They're always a key, and that means here. So something here is going on. And uh, generally, I could follow the action. I could watch the game. But when they did the goals, that's what it was all about for me. It seemed like he was using circular breathing like a jazz musician, yeah. really stretching yeah. out the goals. Like I was told later this is a, a Brazilian commentator who's famous for this. Like he's expert at the goals. So it was great to hear him work. So... Ah, the World Cup's fun. It's only every four years they space it out pretty good. Uh, I guess the U.S. Yeah, doesn't have there's, much. There's a particular chance. there's a particular story behind this World Cup, though, is that you know you've got a lot of people living in poverty in Brazil, and yet they can afford a World Cup. And well, they could barely afford the World Cup. They they probably got everything ready on time. So, you know, it's it's uh, so I'm slightly ambivalent about it. But but who got more goals? I'm guessing it was Brazil. Brazil won two to one. And uh, also, while I was watching the footage, someone did link me a, a what looked like a live link to a protest in Brazil. So presumably, they are protesting the games, as you're saying, because it is, uh, while it's fun for us to watch on TV, it's a light-hearted soccer game, it is a large expenditure of money to build a bunch of stadiums to host the World Cup. And uh, maybe not the best expenditure for Brazil. Yeah, like it's the equivalent of pumping a coin. Like it's just it's just a PR campaign for your I country. I guess the same thing you're... happen in a cutter in a four more years. And in cutter, the situation's so bad, it's so hot. They said at the time they won the cup that they were going to build uh, like floating helicopter type platforms that would block out the sun. And I I thought it seemed like a real long shot then, and it's even more so of a long shot now. So I think what we're going to see in terms of the Bitcoin price is that's just going to roll over. That's that's going to go back down again, and it's going to keep shunting down until it doesn't anymore, and then it's going to stop. <clears throat> and I can't predict it, and neither can anyone else. And anyone telling you they can is wrong. But I still think that this story has still got lots of room to play out. The reason I'm able to make the prediction that it's going to continue to go down <clears throat> is an educated one, based on the fact that this story hasn't finished yet. There's still more news. Like we're still going to yet have to learn like who's going in for the bids and who the people are. There's going to be lots of speculation. But the place to find this news out is not on Coindesk. It's not on the mainstream media. It's certainly not on Twitter hashtagging. It's probably on Reddit or Bitcoin. It's probably on the, the, the Bitcoin discussion forum. It's on all the kind of alternative media places. But Tom, you know, we should probably bring this to an end. But just to say that if we do find out any kind of information, we should probably do another one of these live, these live broadcasts. And people could just tweet us out at World Crypto Net on Twitter. If there's anything you want us to say, I've got that that comes up on my phone. I don't know if it comes up on yours, Tom. So if anyone has anything that they kind of want us to talk about, we should just kind of jump to it and actually start reporting it straight away. No. Also at Mad Bitcoins, if you want to send me any links or anything, I'll probably retweet them. I generally do. And um, we're back at 580. So not that bad. We were at 620, 640 earlier a couple days ago. We'll see how it goes these next couple days as the news spreads out to the world. And remember, this is removing the uh, uncertainty. There was uncertainty how these bitcoins are going to be sell, sold, and now we know. And uh, maybe you don't like it, maybe you like it. 
you got to make your own choices. So uh, we're about to about ready to head out here, close it down. Chris, anything more you'd like to say? Yeah, I just want to say thanks to um, Donation Coins, um, the guys that were asking us all those all the questions, the the, the Skyhook uh, ATM people, uh, Infinite Radio. Thanks a lot, guys, for for tuning in and staying with us all this time as well. I really appreciate that. And thank you to everyone who donated to help bring Chris out here to DC. Yeah. I think it's gonna be a really good time. You're gonna get to see a lot of fun videos, and it's gonna be more fun with Chris there. So thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you so much. And until next time, bye bye. <laughs>